PhD, and also Dr. Miki Kokishi, MD, PhD. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. The Honorable Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Sriwijaya University, Dr. Sharif Husin, Magister of Science. The Honorable, our esteemed speaker, Professor Barbara Goodman, PhD, from University of South Dakota, United States of America. Nikiko Kishi, MD, PhD, from Gunma University, Japan. Christina Karadzaferi, PhD, from University of Thessaly, Greece. And Dr. Dr. Irfan Udin, Sport Medicine Specialist, Magister of Science, Universitas Sriwijaya, Indonesia. The Honorable Moderator of today's webinar, Dr. Ziska Maritska, Magister of Science Medicine, and all of our honorable participants. A very good morning to all ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us praise to Almighty God because of his blessing, we all can gather here today in a great condition. My name is Nuzla Emira Ramadani. As the MC of today's webinar, would like to extend a very warm gratitude to all participants who have attended today's webinar in commemoration of the 59th Dias Natalis Faculty of Medicine Universitas Sriwijaya, or better known as the annual commemoration of Faculty of Medicine Universitas Sriwijaya anniversary. Today's webinar is titled Managing Health and Medical Education During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Challenges and Innovation. We hope all the participants will learn a lot today. The lineup of today's agenda is the first opening, second, singing the national anthem Indonesia Raya, the third, opening remarks, the fourth, first webinar topic, the second webinar topic, the sixth, Q&A session, the seventh, third webinar topic, the eighth, fourth webinar topic, the ninth, Q&A session, and the last is closing. Now we would like to begin this event with singing the national anthem Indonesia Raya. We would invite all ladies and gentlemen to stand up and turn on their camera. Ladies and gentlemen, you may sit back. 
Next, we are pleased to have Dr. Sharif Husin, Magister of Science as the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya, to deliver the opening remarks. To Dr. Sharif Husin, Magister of Science, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua yang terhormat seluruh dekan Fakultas Kedokteran di Indonesia, yang terhormat seluruh guru besar di Fakultas Kedokteran di Indonesia, yang terhormat Kepala Prodi, Kepala Wagian, KSM, Lingkungan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya dan yang, saya terho yang terhormat para dosen di Lingkungan Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya dan para pembicara serta tamu undangan dan seluruh peserta webinar yang kami banggakan. Seperti kita ketahui. Pandemi COVID-19 ini telah berlangsung selama kurang lebih hampir dua tahun. Hal inilah yang menyebabkan banyak sekali perubahan pada semua tatanan kehidupan. Tidak terkecuali pendidikan kita, pendidikan kedokteran, kita semua dituntut untuk mampu beradaptasi dalam situasi ini. Walaupun hal ini merupakan suatu yang sangat sulit dan menantang, tapi diharapkan kita dapat meningkatkan kemampuan kita dalam metode pembelajaran yang mana kegiatannya tetap harus dijalankan. Selain itu, kegiatan webinar ini diselenggarakan sebagai salah satu rangkaian acara Yes Natalis Fakultas Kedokteran Utas Sriwijaya yang kita banggakan ini, yang tahun ini telah menginjak usianya yang ke-50. Sembilan. Kami sangat berbahagia Bapak Ibu sekalian dapat hadir mengikuti acara webinar ini Sedikit informasi yang dapat kami sampaikan Acara ini diikuti oleh ratusan peserta Baik dari dalam negeri maupun luar negeri Good morning and greeting, especially for to our national and international colleagues, distinguished guests, and honorable speaker, Professor Barbara Goodman PhD from University of South Dakota, United States. Mikiko Kisi, medical doctor, PhD, from Gunma University, Japan. Christina Karatzaferi, PhD, from University Tesli, Greece. And our very own faculty member, Dr. Dr. Ivanudin, SPKU, M. Pedicut. First, I would like to humbly welcome you to our webinar. We are delighted to have hundreds of participants coming from across the globe to celebrate 59 Yes Natalis of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas 
Sriwijaya. As we all know, we have been living in pandemic for more than two years now. As a start, all facets of life have been changing rapidly, including the medical education system. We were forced to adapt it and improve our teaching method and curriculum to optimize. If not to maintain the quality of the teaching process in this challenging situation, I can really say that we are here. In this Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya has come together as a team to rise and overcome the challenge. This webinar is held as a sharing moment of challenges, experiences, and innovation of managing health and medical education during COVID-19 pandemic from speakers around the globe. I hope it will be a nice appearance for everyone. Once again, I would like to say thank you to all speakers for joining and celebrating our webinar. Hope our celebration collaboration will continue later on. Air kata, saya ucapkan selamat mengikuti webinar ini. Semoga kita semua dapat mengambil manfaatnya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Sharif Hussein, Magister of Science, for the remarks. Next, we will proceed to the first topic of the webinar. With us today is Dr. Zisko Maritska, Magister of Science Medicine, as the moderator that will lead the discussion with our esteemed speaker. But first, let me give a brief introduction about Dr. Zisko Maritska, Magister of Science Medicine. Dr. Zizko Maritska is a lecturer of from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya, and also working as genetic counselor. For her educational background, in 2007, she is studying for medical doctor degree at Universitas Sriwijaya. In 2014, she is studying biomedical science, majoring in genetic counseling at Universitas Diponegoro. She was general practitioner at Public Health Center and Emergency Unit Pelabuhan Hospital, Palembang, Indonesia. She was also worked as Secretary of Quality Assurance Unit, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya, and currently working as lecturer in Biology Medicine Department, Head of International Office Affairs, and Head of Biology Medicine Department, all in Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya. She also currently working as genetic counselor. Training and courses she is attending in 2020 in Asia Pacific Society of Human Genetics, APSHG Virtual Summer School of Clinical Genetics in 2018, attending fellow researcher at Applied Biomolecular Science and Genetic Engineering Graduate School of Science for Technology and Innovation, Yamaguchi University, Japan, and the rest is as shown on the CV. She is part of professional membership, professional membership such as Asia Pacific Society of Human Genetics, 
Indonesian Society of Human Genetics, Indonesian Medical Doctor Association, Professional Society of Genetic Counselor in Asia, Indonesia Society of Genetic Counselor, and Persatuan Biologi Molekuler Indonesia. Not only that, in 2011, she is the recipient of Ministry of Higher Education Excellence Scholarship in 2012, receiving Overseas Corporations Excellence Scholarship for Twinning Program. The latest is in 2018, when she received Overseas Short Course Scholarship by the Ministry of Higher Education Indonesia. Dr. Ziska is based in Palembang, Indonesia, and you can contact her by the email or telephone attached on the curriculum page shown. And now, please join me to welcome Dr. Ziska Mariska, Magister of Science Medicine. To Dr. Ziska, time is yours. Thank you, Nuzza, for the nice introduction. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu. Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Greetings and a good day for all the honorable speakers, distinguished guests, and all participants, whether in the Zoom meeting and those in YouTube. Welcome to the online webinar in celebrating the 59th annual anniversary of Faculty of Medicine in the Sunset Year. We are thrilled to have you join us online. Thank you all for finding the time and participating in this webinar. My name is Iska Maritska, and I will be your moderator for the next few hours. As you can see on my CV, I'm pleased to say that I'm also one of the alumni and currently working as a lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine in the Fritas Rige, or also known as FKMC. This year marks the 59th DS Natalis of the long and proud history of our beloved FKMC. Despite the ongoing pandemic, we attempt to pull up all the stops in celebrating and commemorating our anniversary by bringing together the world-renowned speakers from all around the globe to discuss challenges and innovations in medical and health education during the pandemic. Before we start, I would like to explain today's rundown again. Each speaker will have a 30-minute session for their presentation. And should you have any questions, feedbacks, or comments for the speakers, you can write them in the chat tab down below and I will help convey them to the speakers. Let me kindly remind you as well that we will have three Q&A session later, as you can see on the schedule earlier. So let's get started. Let us proceed to our very first speaker. It is with a great pleasure to introduce Professor Barbara Goodman from the University of South Dakota, United States, as the first speaker in today's webinar. She will be talking about how to reconstruct curriculum of medical education with online learning method. Professor Goodman has led a long and meaningful career in the field of basic medical science from as early as 1960s up to this date, where she is currently a full-time professor in the School of Medicine, University of South Dakota. She has been honored and recognized globally for various occasions and for many times of which I cannot mention them all, as you can see from her CV on the screen. Professor Goodman has also published and written a great amount of books and or invited chapters in books, journals, abstracts, and there are just so many more astonishing achievements that she has accomplished throughout her career. So without any further ado, I will now turn the session over to the one and only Professor Barbara Goodman to begin her presentation. Barbara, the time is yours. You're still on mute, Barbara. I believe you're still on mute. Okay. Okay. You can see my screen? Yeah. You can see and it me. <laughs> You can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I need to start by saying that um, at the University of South Dakota in 2020, um, in, in March of 2020, when COVID hit in the United States, uh, we went to virtual learning for all the classes until the end of that semester. And then all summer long, the students were not around. But when the students came back in the fall, we actually had um, opportunity to have in-person classes, but the, everybody had to wear masks. And so I was still able to do team-based learning in my classes with masks. Um, and this fall, 
we actually have everybody back in class in person without masks, mostly. Um, it's optional to wear masks because so many people have had the vaccine. So the kinds of things that I had to do last year because of COVID were for the few students that had to isolate or quarantine, not for the whole class, usually. But I have been using team-based and student-centered learning in my classes for a very long time. I currently teach two different levels of classes. I teach advanced undergraduate students who are planning on going to a professional school. And I teach occupational therapy doctoral students. I'm currently not teaching medical students anymore, just the doctoral students in occupational therapy. And then I also teach a class for graduate students on how to teach. So this is based on my experiences in my physiology classes. And the kinds of things that I will be talking about are relevant for any medical educator, not just somebody who teaches physiology. Now I have to figure out why my slides don't advance. Okay, here we go. Here we go, second slide, right? All right, um, so one of the things that I did when I first started teaching occupational therapy students, it was a new group of people for me, um, was that I did these background knowledge probes at the beginning of each of the blocks that we were teaching. I teach um, neuromuscular, endocrine, uh, cardiovascular, and respiratory physiology to them. And knowing that they had had an undergraduate physiology and anatomy course, maybe four to six years earlier, I wanted to know what their knowledge level was when they came into my class as a graduate student. And so I gave them these background knowledge probes, and I've given you the link at the top for the book that it comes from, um, to find out where they were coming from, what they knew already. And uh, the way you do this is I chose 10 topics. It was just a multiple choice test. Um, it was anonymous. They didn't have to write their names on it. Um, and you always have the same answer choices. So action potential, this was the neuromuscular quiz. Have never heard of this, have heard of it, but never really knew what it meant. Have heard of it and could have explained it once, but I cannot recall now. Can recall what it means and can explain it in general terms, but not how it works and can, can recall what it means and can explain how it works. So those were the things that I did at the beginning of each of the blocks to find out the knowledge that my students were bringing into the course. And of course that can also be done remotely. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. Um, they can fill it out and send it to the faculty member. So what I've given in this slide is that I've actually gone through a list of things that I've used in my own classes for short student-centered activities during a lecture, which easily can be done in a Zoom lecture and a face-to-face -face lecture, no matter what you try to do. Um, engagement activities would be something like a little quiz or um, uh, a, um, something at the very beginning of the class to get the class talking about something. A pause procedure would be stopping sometime during the class and letting people either jot down notes or think for a while, it doesn't hurt to think when they're in the middle of a very heavy lecture. Minute papers are something where they actually stop. It doesn't take just a minute, but they write an answer to a question. Um, and I used to do this in my large biology class. I used to have index cards that I gave out at the beginning of the class. And in the middle of the class, I would actually ask them a question and have, have them write it on their index cards and they had to put their names on it because at the time we didn't have any other way to call roll to see if they were in attendance. So they would write a minute paper and then I would be able to use that later on. But they write an answer to a question. Um, and I used to do this in my large- Getting biology. feedback. I used to have- Okay, thank you. Um, so minute papers were also used in my classes. We're going to do a think pair share activity today. I don't know if it'll be sharing, uh, I mean pairing, because I don't know if you're in a space with another person, but we'll talk about that. Um, there are lots of different classroom assessment techniques, and I've given you that reference book at the top of that last slide. You can go there and get more ideas. Uh, those people are um, Angelo and Cross. Basically, they're the bosses 
of what classroom assessment techniques are. And then another kind of thing is discussion-based learning, where you actually just ask the class to talk to each other. And obviously, if you're in a Zoom class, you can do that in breakout rooms by posing a question and having the students go into breakout rooms and discussing it and then coming back. And then you can also have students share either the muddiest point, the thing they understood the least that day, or the best um, knowledge point, the the uh, that they, the thing they liked the best or the thing they learned better this time that they'd never learned before. So that can also be shared. These are very short. They easily fit into one lecture period. You can also do some kind of discussion-based learning in a flipped classroom approach where the flipped classroom means they did something outside of the class. Um, and so in this case, they're having reading assignments outside of the class, or having, uh, having them do certain activities in the textbook or something. Um, there are some special classrooms that are designed that are some used here in the United States. We have two of them at our institution where actually the students are in tables near each other. So they don't, it's not a large lecture-based classroom where they just sit in rows. They're at tables of six to eight students and they actually interact with each other. And those are really nice classrooms if you have the opportunity. So the students would actually read before the class. And then during the class, the professor can ask questions, have them discuss them amongst themselves, look up more information, come back together. Zoom breakout rooms work just fine for this too. And so you can do these kinds of things um, with previous planning of what they're gonna have read outside of class and then coordinate the class discussion. So that's a little bit longer time in a classroom setting instead of those short ones that we just looked at. So even longer, maybe longer than one class period. In my classes, I actually have the students do power lab human physiology experiments using the AD instrument systems. And so they learn by experimentation. They measure EKGs on each other. They measure pulmonary function tests on each other. Um, they measure, uh, neuromuscular nerve conductance tests on each other. And so they can actually learn about physiology by doing physiology in the using the equipment that we have in the class. Um, I also have them read outside of class. So this is uh, also a, uh, a flipped classroom uh, um, exp experience. They have to read the chapter before they come to class to see if they remember anything. <laughs> and in my, my two classes, the undergraduate students have supposedly had a high level physiology undergraduate course before my class and the occupational therapy students probably had a less intense anatomy and physiology course a long time before. And so bringing back to them the knowledge that they previous learned is difficult, but you can actually try having them do readiness assessment tests based on reading and studying before class. Um, then you can do problem-based learning. We'll look at some examples of that and case-based learning and project-based learning. And in my medical school these days, they do something called PBL, but it's actually patient-based learning. So it depends on how you're defining the terms as to which ones you might want to use. So this is actually where I want you to think, <laughs> you, the audience, to think of something that it was mentioned on one of those previous slides that you have either experienced in a class, either a short or long-term team-based student-centered activity that you have experienced in a class or one that you think you would like to try in a class um, and just think about it. And so what I usually do is I actually look at my watch to give people a chance to think quietly because some people like to um, blurt out answers and some people actually think about answers. So I usually give people a minute <laughs> to think, except I can't get my watch to change to the time. <laughs> so um, anyway, we're going to have, have you think about one of those activities that you think would be neat to try or that you've tried in the past. And then if there's somebody nearby <laughs> that you can talk to, um, talk about it with them. That's the pair part. And then I'm going to actually ask if you can be unmuted. And I think the uh, organizers are gonna be able to do that. 
so that a few of you can volunteer your answers for something that you think would be a useful activity to do. So I will give you, let's see here, timer. Because of the fact that I have no idea whether you're near anybody or not, I'm going to leave, leave you working on this for two minutes and then we'll ask for some volunteers. So think and pair if you can. Jadi untuk para peserta yang sekiranya sedang bersama rekannya, boleh untuk memikirkan kira-kira ide apa saja sih yang bisa kita lakukan untuk kelas-kelas kita di Indonesia. Baik itu yang short atau long-term team-based student. Dan beliau sudah memberikan contohnya dari tiga contoh sebelumnya. Jadi silahkan masih diberikan waktu kurang lebih selama dua menit untuk berdiskusi. Nanti setelah dua menit kita mintakan peserta untuk sharing secara sukarela. Terima kasih. So, would anybody like to volunteer something that they think would be an interesting idea to use? I assume that the organizers can see if you raise a hand or ask or put something in the chat. Sure, they can all raise their hands and volunteer to talk. Somebody gets to volunteer. I don't answer my own questions. We will have one, I guess. <laughs> Apakah ada dari para peserta yang ingin berbagi mengenai kira-kira selama pandemi ini bagaimana sih pendekatan yang dilakukan di kelas-kelas dalam pengajaran? Apakah sudah seperti yang contoh tadi Barbara berikan? Misalnya ada yang tentang tadi ada yang short student-centered activities, yang satu kuliah saja, atau yang dalam jumlah yang lebih banyak, ada kayak lima atau tujuh, mahasiswa dalam satu kelompok, lalu ada assignment, reading dulu, lalu sebelum masuk kelas, akan diminta untuk presentasi. Boleh untuk berbagi pengalaman, ataupun juga untuk menyatakan misalnya, wah sepertinya metode ini menarik nih, saya ingin coba, tapi ingin minta arahan lebih lanjut dari pakar kita pada hari ini, Resumber. Bahkan kami persilakan dari para peserta. Ah, we have a hand raised. Okay, let's see. Ah, from Mr. Muhammad Ihsan. Am I reading your name correctly for the committee? Untuk para panitia boleh tolong di spotlight peserta atas nama FKM underscore Muhammad Ihsan. Yeah, we do have one participant raising. Silahkan untuk peserta Muhammad Ihsan untuk langsung saja menyampaikan pendapatnya.
It's a little bit easier to do this if everybody speaks the same language, but sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay, it's still understandable. <laughs> or, ah, okay, you need the whole store. Oh, tolong untuk panitia host untuk memperbolehkan Bapak M. Ihsan untuk berbicara, karena saat ini masih tidak diperbolehkan. Untuk Bapak M. Ihsan, jika diperbolehkan juga untuk menghidupkan videonya agar bisa kami spotlight. Terima kasih. Silahkan Bapak dicoba lagi, sudah di-allow oleh Panitia. Hi, uh, thank you uh, to the committee. Can you hear my voice now? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Ihsan and I'm a lecturer in... Un uh, Republic of Indonesia Defense University, uh, and I'm teaching in pharmacology uh, at Faculty of Medical uh, Military Medicine. Uh, okay, I will share my experience uh, uh, for kind of class that based on team or uh, student center activities. Uh, I will say I will just share uh, generally what we do in Indonesia that uh, for kind of uh, student or problem based learning uh, that or uh, that based on student center uh, we do uh, we can do uh, like uh, giving some appointment uh, or tasks to the students uh, like uh, uh, give some clinical cases uh, and give uh, give them a time to discuss uh, at home and then uh, they will uh, one of the them uh, will represent the team to give a presentation uh, in the class like a seminar uh, method uh, or uh, or we we also uh, we also practice a tutorial uh, uh, I don't know uh, uh, tutorial that uh, the class that consists of uh, like 75 students uh, uh, we call as cadet in our university uh, will be split in seven uh, small groups uh, and they will discuss the same uh, the same cases uh, and uh, we, that will be uh, that will that will be discussed by their group uh, that consists of uh, 10 to 12 cadets uh, per group uh, in two two meetings uh, at all the two, uh, process uh, uh, we we practice uh, a seven jam uh, seven jam process uh, in the first meeting they will uh, they will discuss uh, from the first to the fifth step yeah well thank thank you i'm and glad for, that you can actually uh, the, do seven, this. Uh, the step of six of and seven uh, step. right and, and did um, um with covid are you still able to do this in your breakout rooms Yes, I assume. So, I mean, that, that's the good thing. Uh, you can still do this remotely with a COVID. With COVID. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, this is the specialty in our university that in this COVID era, we still do. Uh, we still do an online uh, class. Why? Because our cadets uh, uh, stay in the same dor dormitory that. Uh, that uh, that always be at, uh, that will always be under our uh, under our supervision uh, in 24 hours. Uh, so uh, and we give them uh, a swab test uh, at least once a week. Uh, so uh, we so we can still uh, do our class because uh, we ensure that uh, they are in a good condition and uh, free of COVID. Uh, virus in in our campus yeah, okay. and also That's for great our, yeah we need to move on but thank you so much for volunteering uh, i really appreciate your contribution thank you uh,
We're going to move to another slide. Um, so here is some examples of how to do team-based learning. Um, and this is the, actually the, I guess you call it the Bible of team-based learning. It's the Mickelson book where he actually explains how team-based learning should be used in uh, college teaching. And what he says is that there should be five to seven students together throughout the entire semester and that the assignments uh, can be given outside of class and you can give readiness assessment tests, which is what I do with my students. Um, after they've done the outside stuff, the um, read outside of class, they come in and they do a re readiness assessment test by, the test by themselves. And then they do one with their team members, which is the same test. And the team members help them decide on what the best answer is. And so they turn in, the way I do it is the individual test counts 10 points, the team test counts, counts 40 points. So it's 50 points total for the team to actually review the material. And it helps a lot with figuring out team rapport and evaluation. One of the things that happened when I first started using team-based learning a number of years ago is that uh, at least in the United States, and I don't know if it's true everywhere, some of the students who are the best students dislike team-based learning because they think that the other students are taking advantage of what they know. And so I'm trying to actually have the students do assessment of each other throughout the time that they're doing their team-based learning. And these are some ideas that I've used in the past so that student, that team members can know whether or not they're being appreciated by their team. One of the things you can do is say, uh, you've got 100 points for your team, divide up the points for how much the team members are actually contributing. And that information can be shared anonymously with the, the students on the team. Or you can do something like the second one where you evaluate the contributions of each person on your team, where basically eight to 10 is an A or a B, five to seven is a C or a D, one to four didn't contribute much at all and zero uh, didn't contribute much and zero they didn't contribute at all. And so at least that way the, the team members know whether they're being appreciated by their team. You can ask these kinds of questions. Do you think the team worked together well or not? Uh, the, of the team members, how many of them participated most of the time and how many were fully prepared for the activities? Um, maybe your students are not like this, but some of our students are what they call social loafers, which means they take advantage of the team by letting the other people do the work and they just show up. And then uh, you can also ask these kinds of questions, give a specific example of something that you learned from your team members and give us a, myth, a specific example of something the other team members learned from you and how would you make changes in your team to improve its performance. So all of this is part of the assessment of team members so the teams will actually work better together. So problem-based learning, uh, the original kind of problem-based learning that we were exposed to was maybe even a mathematical problem like uh, working on the Nernst equation and figuring out the Goldman, Goldman Hodgkin Katz equation for movement of salts across membranes through um, uh, electrical chemical um, gradients. But they can also work on a real life problem. And, and this is not, we're not talking about cases here, but a real life problem that um, might be important. Here in my town, um, one of my colleagues is actually evaluating um, uh, wastewater to find out where, where the COVID um, variants are being found in wastewater. So wastewater is just the sewage water that comes from the toilet. And they're taking samples from the sewage treatment plant to find out when there are higher levels of COVID-19 than there are in, uh, than there were before. And they're keeping track of that. And so then they can actually help the public health people in town figure out more about vaccinations and more about restrictions and, and uh, quarantining for COVID. So that's a real life problem that could have been designed by a team. It wasn't in this case, it was a team of faculty members, but um, you can also provide resources for these kinds of problem-based learning things like he was just talking about. Thank you. 
Um, there's also case-based learning. And if you need to have cases to work on in case-based learning, um, the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science is a generic uh, case-based learning resource for lots of different science courses. Um, it's uh, the, the head, the person who designed it is a physiologist at the University of Buffalo. And he recently wrote a paper about it that will be in advances of physiology education about the data they've collected from those case studies. I use AD Instruments, LD online case, LT long, online case studies. Um, many of you may know AD Instruments, they make power labs. And during the COVID the initial part of the COVID crisis, they made their LT program, which is their educational program, free online. Um, so if you have access to that, you can use that. And Dr. D. Silverthorne's Human Physiology and Integrated Approach textbook, which is the one that I use um, in my course, has lots of case studies in it. So you can use examples from her book too. Okay, for project-based learning, um, what, in one of my classes recently, we just did the divide into topics and teach the other team thing. We had the students actually doing experiments. Half the class did experiments doing 12 lead EKGs using our power labs. And the other half of the class did heart sounds experiments using our power labs. And there were case studies that went along with both of those labs but only half the students did it, so each one. So I actually had the people that learned how to do it by 12 lead EKGs teach the ones that had done the experiments with heart sounds. So we reserved five different small group rooms in the building and they taught each other what they had learned in the lab. That was something that was a topic that I chose, but you can also have the uh, students choose topics as part of their projects. Um, I also have the students prepare a presentation for high school students uh, in renal physiology and how the kidneys work. Um, and we actually have a contest because I have too many teams to actually go to my one small high school. We have a contest to see who does the best job in designing a presentation on how the kidneys work for high school students. Um, I've had students in the past write a case study that could be used in a different class and uh, in my OT class recently, I used those case studies that were written by my undergraduate students a number of years ago. Um, you can also have students prepare a brochure or a website for a lay population. We had students that actually designed a, bro a website for uh, people with diabetes mellitus, type one diabetes mellitus, to help them know why they had to be careful because they might get kidney damage from um, untreated diabetes mellitus. And um, you might want to bring in some outside expert, like maybe an MD or someone from the community. Uh, if it were an architect project, you could bring in an architect to help with the evaluation. So that's project-based learning. Um, I can't recall where this particular slide came from, but uh, this was a breakdown to show the different kinds of group sizes for TBL, PBL, and CBL and the length of time these people would be meeting. This is the readiness assessment test. Um, and officially, I guess, in, according to this author, only the case-based learning was really a human being with patient information, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, the students have to work a lot when they're doing things as a team and they have to actually go and look for outside resources. Um, and uh, in all of these, they require group skills, problem solving skills, and application of content knowledge, which is obviously a level of learning that we would like our students to have. So I've given some resources here. Uh, these are resources that I use or that I know of uh, for physiology, but physiology is not for any kind of thing that you can actually use as a technique for teaching in physiology is relevant for teaching any kind of medical courses. Um, education is broad. And so you can actually use teaching techniques across different disciplines. And this, the life science teaching resource community, which is housed by the American Physiological Society is free. It has lots of ideas for activities, hundreds, of, of ideas for activities at different levels, videos, 
experiments, uh, slides, etc. And you can go there and use that. Um, you can, if you can tend, attend a professional meeting that's face to face, you can go to the teaching section, posters, and learn what they're doing. Um, and in in the American Physiological Society, we have an institute on teaching and learning which is coming up again on June 21st through 24th, 2022. It's gonna be offered every other year for sure from now on, unless we've got the 2020 canceled by COVID. Um, unfortunately, we do not have extra money to support international attendance, but if you can scare up enough money to come, we'd love to have you. It's gonna be in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I host a blog which has physiology educators telling about practices that they've been using in their own classrooms and it's free. And um, I also would love to have contributors to the blog. So go to that link and see if there's something that you might like to write about in your own teaching that would be relevant for other teachers. And I happen to be the editor in chief of Advances in Physiology Education, which broadly publishes life science teaching and education activities and it's also free submission is free and it is free online all the time the um we have a group through the american physiological society called physiology educators community of practice it's pronounced peacock not peacock um, and it's actually a free group of associated people so they just get together and share information through that blog, through other things. Anybody who wants to be a member is a member. It supports physiology educators and educators of other life sciences, um, evidence-based teaching techniques, um, and also how to become leaders in education reform if you want to actually publish in education research. And if you want to join the PCOP, you can use that link and just uh, be sure to say that you want to be a, major, a member of PCOP, then you will be part of all of these other things. And uh, my conclusions for all of this team-based student-centered learning, after having used it for a number of years and even you know, with COVID, it's, it works both ways, um, is that any way that you can actually engage the students helps them learn. So just lecturing and giving exams is not the best way for students to learn. So any of these activities are definitely ways that will help students learn. No class is too big or too small for some of these activities that I've talked about today. And if you want to use that for your scholarship at your institution, it is publishable scholarship, either in online um, places or in journals as educational research. And then I've got one last slide. Um, as part of its new strategic plan, the American Physiological Society is launching a new Center for Physiology Education. And basically what they're doing is they're pooling all of the resources and the programs that have been around in the American Physiological Society for 20 plus years, 30 years, um, under the same umbrella and adding new resources and new opportunities. Um, any of you who are physiologists may know that we actually have been having online webinars for PCOP for physiology educators since the 2020 Institute on Teaching and Learning was canceled. Um, and so that will be part of it. Advances in physiology education is part of it. We're going to have a lot more programming. And at this point, those of you that participated in our webinars last summer know they were free. You didn't have to be a member of the American Physiological Society. Um, at this point, some of the things that we will be offering in the future for this Center for Physiology Education may require membership in the American Physiological Society, but we'll try to keep as many of them as possible free. So it's kind of a commercial, but this is the, the direction that we hope that we're going in, um, in encouraging evidence-based teaching throughout the globe in life sciences and in medical schools. So if anybody has any questions, my email is there, barb.goodman at usd.edu. And I'd be happy to share things with you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Barbara Goodman for the insightful presentation. It is indeed true that there is no class is too big or no class is too small for some activities using student-centered learning. 
I believe we already have some inquiries from the audience regarding your talk just now. I will help with the questions for you. Okay, good. Okay, first question comes from Mr. Santosa. Question for Professor Barbara. Okay. On full on online learning of clinical skills training, especially for undergraduate students, can you give tips for how to increase skills capability in COVID-19 pandemic situation? Like students have limitation on learning materials, medical tools, simulated patients, and a lot of things. Do you have any oh. tips on? <laughs> I think there've been some, pa some papers recently in advances of physiology education about how to do um, labs in your home. Um, and, and some of the things that I know are happening is that somehow either by normal kinds of things that people might have in their home or in their dormitory or by little kits that are released by the faculty member, there are things that students can take with them to learn some of these skills that they wouldn't be able to do in a face-to-face -face situation because of COVID. So um, making some kind of a kit or some way of actually practicing something in a different way um, is probably helpful. The simulated patient thing, um, I, I remember one paper, which I believe was from somewhere in Asia uh, about a year ago in advances that was talking about how um, uh, in, for, it was respiratory physiology and they were doing pulmonary function testing and the professor actually gave access to his own computer to the students in his class so that they could do the, the calculations for the pulmonary function test. And I haven't done that, but that's that was part of what he did was he actually released access to his computer so that they could work on the calculations for that simulated situation. So there are questions, those are things that are, uh, there have been a number of papers and advances recently and they're still being submitted on how to make some of these adjustments during the um, COVID pandemic. Okay. I hope that answered. Yeah, I think that answered already the question. Like, we have to prepare some kids, or probably like the professor did, that you mentioned before, we give them access to our computer to access the teaching materials. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? You may, you might want to ask by raising your hand, and then the committee will allow you to speak or you can try to text them in Indonesian and they'll help you to translate it in English. I really need to agree with you, Barbara, that you say teaching methods is actually general, that it can be applied generally, like the resources that you shared before, although we come from different background, science background, we can still use it. Like, oh, this kind of methods, it can be applied in our field of science as well. So it truly is general. Right, we have had um, three face-to-face -face institutes on teaching and learning, um, which were are aimed at physiology educators. But after the first two, the third one, we actually invited a chemistry professor to come and talk about things that they were doing in chemistry and somebody from psychology and some, you know, so basically the kinds of educational improvements that are being made are, are universal and they can be used in any courses. Yeah, that is true. Teaching methods is general and as long as we are willing to do it, we can try to do the student-centered learning in every class or academic activities that we have in our institution. Okay, I think, is there any more questions from the audience? So I, I have a point. Um, according to the people that talk about um, keeping students engaged, um, what they say is that you should really not lecture longer than 20 minutes at a time without doing something. So either a pause break, or ask a question and let the students contribute answers. If you have a polling po uh, option, for where you're work for where you're teaching, ask a polling question. More than 20 minutes takes away, they're, they're, they're not thinking anymore after 20 minutes. So you need to take breaks about every 20 minutes. 
So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, it's true that sometimes we are too like focused for more than 20 minutes. We can, we tend to lose our focus. Okay, we already have questions from the audience. There are two people raising their hands. Probably the first opportunity we will ask Professor Hardy Darmawan to ask questions. Thank you, Dr. Fuske. Thank you very much, Professor Barbara Goodman, sure. for nice lectures. I'm from the Department of Physiology, University of Srivijaya. Uh, I would like to ask you, but uh, between the four PBL, PBL, CBL, and PBL, what is the proportions of the hybrid of the system, the four system, in your experience in teaching? How, this how much am I using those? Yes. Okay, well, I, I gave you some examples of the things that I use in my own classes, but I don't necessarily call them TBL, PBL, or CBLs. Um, I do use cases frequently, um, it, particularly from Silverthorne's textbook, because she has such great ideas. So usually in the middle of a lecture, I'll throw in something that has a case-related question, um, but it's not a case-based learning. It's just a case-related question. Um, so uh, the projects I use uh, because they take planning outside of class, um, I give my students time during the class period to work on those projects as teams. And I only do one per block. So um, once a month, maybe. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So oh, in my occupational therapy class right now, they're doing endocrine physiology and it's a, about a three week session. And I've asked them to prepare a presentation to teach their colleagues something. And so, you know, obviously endocrine's really easy because you can talk about too much hormone, too little hormone. And so they're all doing those things. They're going to be presenting them next week. But because they're occupational therapists, physicians, I mean, clinicians, and they will have to interact with patients, I'm making them do something interactive with the class. So they're going to have to plan a game. They're going to have to plan a quiz. They're going to have to plan a, a worksheet, something creative, as if they were relating to a real human being, a patient, um, about that particular topic, in addition to teaching us. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Weber. Most, okay. of the most of the students are very interested in doing that kind of integrated between the basic medical sciences and the clinical applications. Yeah, yeah, more... we have a lot of clinical stuff. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Harvey, for the questions. Next question, we will give this opportunity to Dr. Rizki Nawawi. If you may. Okay, Dr. Ziska, thank you for the opportunity. Good morning. I'm Rizki Nawawi. I'm a member of the microbiology department in the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Srivijaya. Uh, I would like to ask the following question. Based on your experience, Dr. Goodman, does the size of the group and the way that the class is being carried out, whether it's online or in person, have any significant impact on the team-based learning process and its outcomes? Thank you very much. Well, obviously one of the things that um, it, it is impacted by the size of the class is if you ask all the teams to make a presentation because that takes a lot of time. And um, I was asked recently if I could add 32 students to my 32 person occupational cl therapy class. And I said, no, because I have to have, them, they do at least a 20 minute presentation with every block and I don't have enough time to add more teams of people doing presentations. You don't wanna have a team that's too big, like eight. That would be way too many students to have to be involved in a team and some people wouldn't be doing anything. So I think that has something to do with it. But I think breaking the class into teams and having them work on things as teams is not, uh, it doesn't matter how many students are in the class. Thank you for the answer. I guess that already answers your question, Dr. Iski. <laughs> okay, we have another question from Dr. Wizar Putri Malaratna. 
Dr. Wizar is a dermatovenerologist from University of Maliku Saleh, Lok Sumawe. It's also a university located in Sumatra Island. She would like to ask how to improve the student's quality in writing, such as case report that can be published internationally. Meanwhile, in their hospital, still have limited facility, such as laboratory examination that can impact on quality of the research. Do you have any tips on how to improve the skills in writing? Well, have them do it. <laughs> And then actually, I'll get back to them about whether it's good or not. Uh, it, we have a class, I teach a class in the spring semester on how to teach to graduate students. And uh, these are our master's students who basically are just trying to get a master's degree so they can go to medical school. So they're, they really don't want um, a, a doctorate degree in research. They want to go on to medical school. And... Um, my school was upset because they didn't think that the students were learning how to write scientifically. So when they assigned them to my class, they told me I had to have a paper. And so I've asked them to write a scientific paper, which I edit and get back to them. I actually don't grade it, but I do edit it and I give them advice on what would make it a better paper. Um, so uh, practice makes perfect. We've heard that before. The best thing to do is try to do it. Practice makes perfect and practice makes progress. Right. And peer editing also works very nicely. So if, in that class, I have them just share with their classmates for a first edit. So, yeah, it's really a nice thing to do, like peer assessment, like you've mentioned before. Okay. I think we have come to the end for the first session. Thank you very much for the insightful and valuable presentation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And yeah. all, of, all of you people out there, thank you very much. Mm, it is such an eye opening. So now we know that student centered learning is truly one of the favorable methods to create engagement. And in turn, it will help the students to learn and comprehend better. Thank you as well for the resources once again. And it is such an honor to have you today in our webinar. Before we come to an end, we would like to virtually hand out the certificate for you, the e-certificate. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> because we cannot send, we will, we will send it like all the way from Indonesia to the United States, but in the meantime, we will hand out the e-certificate. Oh, very okay. nice. That's very nice. Thank you. Now we will have a photo session along with other participants as well. Untuk panitia boleh diberi aba-aba untuk fotonya. All the participants may turn on the camera for the photo station. Barbara here is already ready with her smile. <laughs> okay. I'll take the lead then. One, two, three, cheese. Okay. Thank you once again, Professor Barbara Goodman. We are hoping that we could meet you again in another like probably after the pandemic ends. Like you said before, your class will start this fall without them to put on masks. It's optional in America right now. But here- In, in South Dakota. South Dakota, <laughs> nice yeah. to hear. We will try to catch up soon. Thank okay. you once again for your attending. Thank you. Webinar. Well, thank you. See you Thank again you. in Beijing next year. I hope so. Yeah, Dr. Yifran is hoping to see you next year in one of the events or occasion. In Beijing. Oh, yeah. I, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I <laughs> yes. would like to come to Beijing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the audience for still staying with us. Now we are moving on to the next session where we would have our second speaker, Mikiko Kishi, MD, PhD, who will be talking about her experience in her institution regarding adapted curriculum for a medical doctor or health professionals program during pandemic. Dr. Kishi is an associate professor and division director of the Center for Medical Education in Duma University, Graduate School of Medicine. 
After obtaining her PhD in medicine, she gained her experience in research and teaching for eight years at Gunma University and Kiryu University, which is also in Gunma Prefecture, before joining a center for medical education at Gunma University in 2011. Since her appointment to the center, her career has been more focused on education than on research. She is also engaged in educational activities outside the university, such as a member of the organization that coordinates the National Common Achievement Task in medical field. The Center for Medical Education provides support for both faculty and students through a wide range of services, including the management and administration of the entire curriculum through like CBT, OSCE, and student counseling. As the director of the basic medical education division of the center, she has played an important role in managing student education with eight other staff members. So please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Kishi. Thank you for introducing me. It's an honor to be here. Okay, let me share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. Today, I'd like to take this opportunity to share our experience, how we have adapted to the new situation during a pandemic crisis. The impact of the pandemic in Japan, as in other countries, was so great that everyone was thrown into confusion. Even under such circumstances, the faculty tried their best to provide better education, and students were able to realize that this is not the same as the ordinary days, where they can just go to university and take classes anytime they want but look at it as a very important means of learning. Currently, the impact of COVID-19 is still experienced by everybody. However, with the spread of online education, both teachers and students have become more comfortable with current education. We are also using face-to-face -face classes as we monitor the situation. I hope that in the future, students will be able to spend a college student-like life without worrying about infection. I think today's seminar will play a very important role in sharing with them for that purpose. Today, I will give you an update on the situation in Japan and then introduce how we have responded to the pandemic at the university level, the subject level, and the faculty and the student level in 30 minutes. At the end of 2019, the WHO announced an outbreak pneumonia of unknown cause. The unexpected and rapid global spread of the infectious disease, later named COVID-19, has had a profound impact all over the world. This figure shows the number of infected people in Japan. The first wave started in February of 2020. The orange band indicates the period of the emergency declaration. Emergency declarations are issued for each prefecture, but this figure shows the one for Tokyo. In Japan, there was no lockdown policy. Emergency declarations impose restrictions on going out, but there are no penalties. It is only a request for self-restraint. This was unforeseen when the new coronavirus was first spreading, but now we have the fifth wave. It's sitting down in Japan. Vaccination against the new coronavirus began in February 20. 
and 50% of the population has now received their second dose. Overlay this figure with a green band indicating the college semester. The Japanese academic year begins in April and ends in March. And since the COVID-19 started to spread in February, most schools canceled their graduation and entrance ceremonies as requested by the government. It was disappointing for the students, the parents, and of course the teachers, because we were not able to celebrate this milestone in their lives. Now, this is a map of Japan. There are 47 prefectures. I used a heat map showing the number of infected people, but the truth is that the country is full of greenery. Gunma Prefecture, where the Gunma University located, is in the middle of the main island in Japan. It is 100 kilometer north of Tokyo, but it only takes an hour to get to Tokyo by bird train. Have we ever thought of how schools have tried to adapt themselves to the new normal situation in this pandemic crisis? Maybe we can start with our own university. Now, let me introduce Gunma University. It is a national university and was founded in 1949. Its predecessor school was established in 1873. Today, it has four faculties and five graduate schools. They are following the Faculty of Education, Faculty of Science and Technology, Faculty of Medicine, and Faculty of Informatics. I work at the Faculty of Medicine. The total number of undergraduates is about 5,000. Of these, there are 750 medical students from first to sixth year. Every April, when the new school year starts, we welcome students and spend time with them to help them develop a new life on campus with us. However, that did not happen in 2020. On March 24, just before the start of the new school year, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sport, Science, and Technology issued a notice regarding measures to prevent the spread of the infection, handling of academic schedules, use of remote classes, handling of tuition fees, and to support for the student learning. This was a time when we were urgently required to make decisions because the changes in the academic calendar was approved. Many universities postponed the start of the new semester to accommodate this situation. This chart shows the postponement of the new semester at universities across Japan on April 23. The survey covers not only medical schools, but also various other universities. 69 out of 75 national universities, including Gunma University, postponed the new semester. For the total, 662 out of 70, 748 universities have postponed the start of classes. At our university, we postponed the new semester for two weeks to prepare for the following. We choose Zoom as the main platform and created university Zoom account. We also set up hardware, such as additional wireless LAN access points, headsets, and webcams. Setting up a simple studio with a wired LAN was a lead was a relief for delivering online classes. 
because we did not have a studio, so we had to convert some small group study room to studios. This graph shows the number of Japanese universities that have adopted face-to-face -face classes. Yellow green bar shows face-to-face -face classes. And the blue bar shows online classes. The dark green in the middle shows the number of universities that use both face-to-face -face and online classes. The left map, oh, I'm sorry. The leftmost bar is May 2020 at the beginning of the school year. June, July, September, and the rightmost is March 2021, which is the end of the school year. Before the pandemic, almost all of the classes were face to face. But as soon as COVID-19 spread, almost all the classes went online. Since then, the number of infected people has increased with each wave of infection, but face-to-face -face class has gradually returned. On the far right, in the last month of the school year, the number of online-only university has decreased to about 2%. However, it is not as face-to-face -face only as it used to be. And 60% of the university have adopted both formats. Next, let's move on on something more familiar. I mentioned earlier that our university has delayed the start of the semester by two weeks. In addition to that, there were also changes made at the subject level by the teachers. For example, in courses that have lectures and experiments, The lectures were changed to the earlier and the experiments later. This was done in the hope that the situation would get better later on. Unfortunately, that expectation was not come true, but by putting up the experiment, we were able to give the students more time to get used to the infection control before face-to-face -face class starts to introduce online classes, it is essential that all students have to have an internet connection so that we have to support them to set up the comfortable network environment. The university supported the students by lending PCs and Wi-Fi routers and subsidizing the purchase of necessary equipment uh, and learning management system was used to distribute course materials and submit assignment. To conduct online classes, we prepared all subjects to use the LMS. FD sessions were held many times to ensure the smooth running of online classes, so even teachers who are not strong in IT managed to start online classes. Our Center for Medical Education formed an online class support team to help teachers get used to online classes. Students prepared equipment as mentioned earlier to take online classes at home. And students need to be mentally prepared for this situation as well as the equipment. Students who lived alone had to spend time in a lonely environment because they had to stay at home. Especially first grade students 
were not able to know each other even after the start of college, which caused mental stress. The senior student willingly supported new students by holding online roundtable discussion and counseling session for course planning. We really appreciate them. Next, I will introduce some online classes. I'm sure you have already done so. This is very brief introduction. I'll start with a lecture. In the real time online class, it's relatively easy to convert to online format. It is possible for the teacher to present materials such as PowerPoint on the screen and ask questions to the students and for the students to ask questions to the teacher using the chat function. In the face-to-face -face class, raising one's hand to ask a question may be hard, but doing so through chat box seems to be easier for them. And I have the impression that there are more questions from students via chat box than in face-to-face -face classes. In addition, group discussions could be held in real-time classes, which provided a valuable opportunity for students who had been forced to stay home alone for a long time to interact with their classmates. But this advantage is difficult to know students' understanding level from their facial expressions as we do. Okay. The next slide is for lectures on demand online. In an on-demand on class, the, the instructor prepares a PowerPoint presentation or video and post it on the LMS for the students to view at their own convenience. Therefore, questions can be asked asynchronously through message in the LMS or by email. The advantage of the on-demand class is that students can watch the videos at their own pace of understanding. In a survey on on-demand type classes by Mitoma, about 70% of the students responded that the on-demand type was easier to understand. In addition, about 65% of the students spent 1.5 times longer than the set time to watch the lecture, indicating that they deepened their understanding by pausing and repeating the part they did not understand. Its weakness is that there is no real-time interaction with teachers or classmates. Well, for group discussion, PDL or TDL. This part, Dr. Gutman made a great presentation earlier. So just a brief read. At our university, we used Zoom and Moodle to conduct PBL and TBL. For example, in a real-time class, a breakout room in Zoom was used for group discussions, and a teacher went around to each room. When the design time was up, they returned to the original room for a plenary presentation and discussion. Quiz through Moodle, I mean LMS, was used to test comprehension. Group discussions are also possible in on-demand classes by preparing a forum in LMS for asynchronous discussions. Students could post their opinions whenever they wanted in the forum discussion. Another advantage was that the discussion process would remain in the forum so that the faculty could check later 
the roles played by individual students. Okay. okay. And for the experiments and the practical training. In basic medical science classes, experiments and practical training play an important role in understanding the function of living organisms and various pathological conditions, as well as providing opportunities to learn how to operate, experiment, and write reports. Although the hundreds were probably higher than those for lectures, the transition to online classes was carried out with various innovations. In the online experiments and practical training, the operation of laboratory equipment and experimental technique were shown through teaching materials with pictures and demonstration by teachers. In most cases, students had to write a report on the interaction of the result, on the interpretation of the result, the experimental process, and the discussion of the results based on the given virtual data. In the physiology at our university, we conducted a real-time hands-on training. After the instructor showed the students on how to measure their own pulse rate through the screen. The students observed the changes in pulse rate due to exercise and breath holdings by sharing the result in class. We were able to achieve our goal of helping the students understand the cardiovascular system. Let me share the video. Can you see the videos? ですか。3本の指ともに脈拍が感じられるように触ってください。いいでしょうかね。はい。それではで、です。まあ、さっきも言ったように、親指の付け根ですね。親指の付け根に動脈化してますから、この親指の付け根のところ、3本の指で触ります。見て。Can you see the video and the voice? Yes, we can see the video and hear it clearly. Okay. I will continue. くださいいいですか親指の付け根のところを3本の指で触ります。3本の指で触って、3本の指で触ります。で、えー、正しく触れればいいですか正しく触れれば、3本の指とも脈を触れることができます。いいですかで、えーと、親指ですけれども、軽くこういうふうに、えー、握ってもらう。いいですか手で握る感じになります。あいいでしょうかで、えー、脈を測るときは心臓の位置に心臓の高さのところに腕を保持をします。いいですか、えー、今の状態で皆さんちゃんと脈が測れているでしょうか、はい、今言ったように私がやってみて脈を測れてますかさて、それでは、えー、とここからですね、3分間、えー頑張ってもも上げをします。私もやります。はい、それでは、えー、ここからですね、頑張って三分間、えー、もも上げをしていきます。思いっきりこう上げましょうね。こうね、思いっきりもも上げると,ということでやります。はい、それでは三分間、用意始め。はい、終わりです
プレートカードにぶつけてしまいました膝をはいそれではこれから重力を始め測りますはいいいですか3本の指ともに脈拍が感じられるように触ってください。いいでしょうかね。はい。それでは、でです、まあ、さっきも言ったように、親指の付け根ですね。親指の付け根に動脈化してますから、この親指の付け根のところ。Okay, the, media, the video was finished and repeated. So I changed to my slide. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, it's back on your slide again. Okay, thank you. So, how was the video? I think you can see how the teachers practice together. This was an example of how we were able to shift from face to face practice to online practice with relatively few adjustments. Thus, there will be a greater need in the future to develop practical training that students can do at home. I'd like to share a few tips about online classes here, especially for online experiments. When recording and distributing experimental procedures, it is recommended to use a stand to stabilize the angle of view. Speak more slowly and clearly than in face to face experiments. So that students can understand easily. And since students send questions and report of communication problems via chat, it is recommended to assign a person in charge of handling chat box in addition to instructors. And there are something to be concerned about personal information protection. In clinical classes, it is necessary to present CT and skin finding, etc. So, personal information has been removed, but care must be taken to broadcast it. It is also necessary to be careful in distributing episodes that students can, be, can learn from, such as how you supported a person with an illness and what kind of feeling they share with you. It's also a personal information, very personal thing. Okay, now the next slide shows the result of a satisfaction survey on changes in teaching style caused by COVID 19. It's conducted by the Association of Japan College and it targets medical students nationwide at the beginning of the second semester. The bottom bar is the total of, total of all grades. Above that is first year students, second year students, and the top is sixth year students. The yellow green area on the far left is the percentage of students who are very satisfied. And the green area is the percentage of students who are somewhat satisfied. If we add up these results, we can see that about 60% of the students are satisfied with the change in class format. However, the satisfaction level of fifth and sixth year students is low. One possible cause is that it was difficult to replace clinical classes with online practice. The lack of adequate training is thought to have increased dissatisfaction.
Okay. Even though face to face have gradually started, face to face classes have gradually started, online classes are still necessary until the complete termination of the pandemic. In addition, advantage of online classes will allow us to combine it with face to face classes even in after Corona era. In the corona disaster, I'm sure that there are many universities that move their classes online without having enough time to prepare. As a reflection of the 2020 classes, it was difficult to, to obtain non-verbal information in the online classes, and it was difficult to make detailed adjustments according to the student's level of understanding. I am also concerned about the mental stress on students caused by staying at home and online classes. I feel that we need to support students, not only in terms of their studies, but also in terms of mental health. The environment, of, the environment is still unfamiliar and stressful for both teachers and students. However, we, we would like to take this as an opportunity to reduce the purpose and methods of our class and improve it. Well, this is the last slide. My special thanks to the foreign individuals who have helped me and guided me in all aspects. And they are also the member of online class support team. Special mention goes to Dr. Nori Koibuchi he is an expert in medical education and always gives us good advice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishi, for the insightful presentation. The pandemic has definitely hit every one of us significantly, including our medical education system. Yes. We all share a lot of things in common where we are forced to adapt and rapidly transform our previous medical education platform into an online one. There are certainly pluses and minuses from this transformation indeed. Now we are moving on to a 10 minutes Q&A session from the participants. I believe we already have several questions from few participants. I will help read the questions for you. First question comes from Mr. Santosa asking two questions at once. During the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, the medical institutions all over the world are already strengthening their learning management system, such as the Zoom system and studio's equipment for video production. His questions are, first, how to strengthening the learning skills building capacity of students or lectures such as how to give feedback, monitoring system, and assessment system in a full online learning course? And second question is, how to do a balanced proportion of face-to-face -face and online learning methods, or how to deliver the blended learning system? If there are any priorities such as skills training for the face-to-face -face learning or vice versa? If you may, you may answer the questions directly, Dr. Kishi. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, for the first question, let me read again. So the first one is how to do how to strengthen the learning skills building capability of the students or lecturers, okay? Such as how to give feedback, mentoring, uh, mentoring system and assessment system is full online learning. Process. Yeah, it's very difficult to do in full online system. I agree. In okay, in our case, so. For teachers, for teachers, my center, I mean, uh, Center for Medical Education, provide a support system. So anytime they want, they can ask us to help them. Like, how can we do, or how can how can we handle? And we advise how to use the chat box or how to use the uh, what what was that Google Forms to get feedback or give feedback, or how to use learning management system effectively. Actually, the learning management system is very nice system and do many things. 
including, including giving feedback and monitoring system. So let me, let me check. Something happened to my... My PC, okay. And I need to find where the question is. Oh, you want to read the question again? Okay. And could you please show the questions? Okay, we'll share the question again. Yes, please. Mohan, we share kembali. For the first question that you have answered is about to how to strengthen the learning skills building capacity of students or lecturers such as how to give feedback, monitoring system, assessment system in a full online learning course. Mm -hmm. The second one is how to balance the proportion of face-to-face -face and online learning method, or how to decide what activities should be delivered in blended learning. Okay. Panitia, mohon di share kembali. Pertanyaan-pertanyaannya. Do you still need to wait for the slides to show the questions or is it enough? Oh, here it is. You may read the questions on the slide. Very. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, it depends on the capacity of the classroom actually, because the number of students that can be in one classroom is reduced. Is that the same in Indonesia too? I'm not sure about that. Yes, it's the same in Indonesia too, that we have to reduce the number. Oh, I see. So in that case, we need to select what class is Uh, we have we have to another one. We have to select when this class come to school and what and when this class comes to school, like a puzzle, because we don't have enough classroom. We we need to plan the like Monday for the first grade and second grade, and Wednesday for the fourth grade and third grade like that. Mm -hmm. But maybe we, maybe we can, we can consider about the combination, like, like a lecture, just, just lecture style can be done in, can be done in online and for the practice, especially the clinical class, it should be done face to face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, for the lectures, it is preferably to do online and for the practice or skills lab, it is recommended <laughs> to do it face to face. Thank you for yeah, that. So, so they have priority. Yeah, sure. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Rini Nindela. As for the methods of teaching practices and skills lab through online demonstration, where we only share the videos, how to effectively evaluate and to assess the ability of the students after following the classes? Do you have any suggestions on how to evaluate and assess their skills after they watch the video of certain skills? Oh, no, not, okay, not the acknowledgement skills. Yeah, and, and in online, <laughs> okay. Yes, that's yeah, to, to evaluate the, it in online is pretty hard. And my university choose that online evaluation, online evaluation. So like a TVL, we put the, put the student in small group and one tutor goes into that breakout room and students do that, do their, students show their skills through their video. 
like how to so there how are hmm, they are expected to show their skills yeah. through an online show, video as well show how like uh, for example when students want to show how to listen to the person's chest they put t-shirts on the hang hunger so so he or she see do a he or she hear the chest chest voice uh -huh. mm -hmm. so yeah Im imitate i mean uh, imitate yeah Basically, after they watch the videos, the lecturer or the instructor will ask them to show how to do it through the yeah. video as well. And the yeah. lecturer or instructor will evaluate them through the videos. Yeah, it's not very accurate. Mm -hmm. But it is one of the ways that can be implemented during this time. Yeah, but uh -huh. not, not very best, but better than nothing. Yes, it's true. Not the best, but it's better than nothing. Okay, next questions. We actually have run out of time, but we still have a lot of questions coming from the audience for you. I uh, think we still have probably five more times. Five, more, sorry, five more minutes to do the question session. Okay, next question is, could you share some approaches that you have taken to anticipate or address mental health issues in students in relation to COVID? Because with all the changes, it will also impact the students' mental health. Like they have to adapt rapidly and they have to follow some courses online without having to see their friends or lecturers. Oh, excuse me, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, which, which question you choose? The third question is, could you share some approaches that you have taken to anticipate or address mental health issues in students in relation to COVID. Like uh -huh. they probably have to rapidly adapt and they cannot see their friends as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we monitor the students' attendance. Mm -hmm. So if we find students who are frequently, frequently absent, we, we email to them or call them and ask what happened to them. And if needed, we, ad we, we advise them to call to school counselor to ask some help. Yes. So we ask a lecturer and ask for the institution, we need to be proactive in identifying the students who are probably in need of help. Yeah. Find earlier, the better. Uh, earlier, the better. And we can help earlier too. So yes. I think this will be the last question. Thank you for the audience for the actively participating. The last question is, is there any, sorry, I have to read from the chat. Is there a standardized questionnaire related to the assessment of indicators in online learning on lab skills? Ah, not for online learning. <laughs> I see. Not yet. We not need yet. to. We need to make it. Okay. So currently, we don't have any standardized questionnaire. No. Uh, no. Probably in the future, we will try to develop one so that it can be applied in yeah. many institutions. Yeah, in terms of online evaluation. Mm hmm. Okay, I think that's all for the questions. We already passed our time session. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishi. It is such an honor to have you here on today's webinar. Before we come to an end for this session, we would like to once again virtually hand out the e-certificate for you. Untuk para panitia, mohon di share certificate-nya. Arigato gozaimasu, Dr. Uh, we would like to ask for the participants to turn on the camera, like they say in Japan, is like <laughs> Oh, you're pretty good at Japanese. <laughs> no, I only speak a little. 
Okay. On my count, should I do the counting on Japanese as well? No. Let's do just one, two, three, okay? Oh. One, two, three. Oh. Once again. <laughs> three. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishi. It is really such a valuable and fruitful experience for us to listen to you sharing about what happened in your institution during this time of pandemic COVID-19 that hit us significantly all over the world. Thank you very much. We hope to see you again one day in the future. Probably you could come visit us in Palembang, Indonesia. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Yes, best regards for Professor Nori. Okay. Thank you all for the participants who are still staying with us until the second round. Shortly, we will have five minutes break. So you can go get your coffee or take a break from your screen for a while, do some stretchings. We hope to see you again in 10.05. Have a good break. Hello? Oh, hello, Christina. Hello, how are you? You're yeah, fine. We just finished with Mikiko Kishi. Yes, right now I was watching, watching the, the end, very nice. Uh, uh, should, um, is it a way for me to um, upload, um, uh, sorry, share screen, just oh. a, a, a moment before to make sure? that sure, everything sure. is okay or this is live stream too <laughs> this is also in live stream but it's okay we can have a practice session because the participants is having a five minute break you should have a break too sorry uh, i'm just uh, i i have to work That's with okay. one screen now yesterday with the test we had two screens so it was easy to share the screen the second screen but now i have one and i just want to make sure that we see uh, the presentation and not the, um, you know, the other way around. Okay. Uh, let me see. So if I share the screen, I need to have it first in presentation mode or I'll do it uh, later. Let me see. You can try to do it on presentation mode so that we can see whether it works or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think now. Untuk panitia mohon diganti untuk tampilan layarnya. Terima kasih. It tells me the share has failed to start. It has failed to start sharing. Mm -hmm. Do I have the license from you to start sharing? Yes, wait, wait, I'll go check the comment first. Untuk Panitia, apakah sudah di allow untuk Christina to share video atau PowerPoint-nya? Sudah, sudah kosong. Sudah ya? Okay, they already allow you to share the presentation, so I think it will work right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, just give me a moment again. Sure. Okay, so there is a combination of of um, uh, Q and S. Okay, so. Is it sharing now? Unfortunately, no. We haven't seen okay. anything. There is also a, a bit of a delay on the. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It will probably the cost. Um, if Soilia, um, Soilia has must have received now my PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. We'll try one more time, and if it doesn't work, uh, then we can try for you. Yeah, from you. Okay. 
So I can share this, which is the. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it shows right now. Yeah, but it shows. What does it show? Does it show the slideshow or the. Um, show right now. Does it show the slideshow or the notes? It's only the slideshows. So if I go one more, we are slideshow, okay. no notes. Okay. Yeah. It works finally. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, we're gonna start the session again. Now we have come to the third session of today's webinar. Thank you for staying with us as this webinar gets more and more interesting. For the committee, would you please help to spotlight Christina's video so that the audience can see clearly who the speaker is? Okay. For this session, we will have another expert from the other side of the globe, all the way from Athena, Greece. She is currently an associate professor in exercise physiology in the University of Thessaly, Greece. She also has a long and amazing list of experiences in so many projects worldwide with multiple publications in high impact journals. Okay, please welcome Christina Karadzaferi, PhD from the University of Thessaly, Greece, talking a lot about adaptation on practice-based learning during pandemic. Your time starts now for 30 minutes, Christina. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be with you in this anniversary event. It's an amazing idea to bring together uh, people from all over the world and to share our experiences and learn from each other. So thank you, Dr. Irfanuddin. Thank you, the organizing committee for the opportunity to be here. So the truth is that we all had quite a lot of challenges and it is important to try to start putting our minds around what we did and what we learn from this experience. So, I'll give you some background and then um, of our institution and our mode of operation. Then we'll discuss the challenges that we recognize uh, through our faculty meetings that we are facing. Give an example of practice-based learning adaptation, just a small example. And from that, take the opportunity to highlight faculty and student experience during the pandemic lockdowns and some lessons learned for the future and more challenges to come, I would say. So where we are located, if we see a map of Europe, this is Greece. In the middle of Greece is a region called Thessaly or Thessalia. The university was founded in 1984, is one of the new universities of, of uh, Greece. Volos is this city here. Um, which is the formal seat of the university, but campuses are around Thessalia. And I am now located here in the middle of Greece in Trikala. There are over 40,000 uh, uh, students of this university making it the third largest in Greece and quite a lot masters and PhD students overall. We uh, are located, as I said, in Trikala. This is uh, a department that uh, was founded in the late 90s. We are a very young department now, about uh, 24 faculty with uh, 15 teaching staff and technical and administrative staff. We have one uh, established center of research and two independent labs. And we have a good rate of employability. And that's something that we strive for uh, among the departments in, in Greece, ours has the highest rate uh, of employability, at least with the recent data. 
A program of undergraduate study in Greece uh, lasts for four years, unless it's medical school, which is six years, or engineering, which is five. So all the other science degrees, uh, four years. And we have a basic cycle in the first two years in our sports science and physical education degree, and then some specialization cycle in the third and fourth year. Our senior students uh, essentially choose a direction to specialize, and that also informs their um, professional rights after graduation, if they're going to be working in the health sector or uh, applied sports performance or adapted physical education. And then following a four uh, year cycle uh, for undergraduate, somebody can go for a master's and, and then a PhD. We have, we are very active in uh, postgraduate programs in our department. I highlight the biologically uh, informed ones, which is the exercise for health, where half of our uh, students are actually medics and nurses. Uh, the Masters in Military Fitness and Wellbeing, I think it's the only one internationally uh, on this subject. And other related ones like this one, we, which runs in collaboration with the medical school. So we have a good uh, base also of research students. My own service, my department, contains teaching, of course, in the bachelor's and the postgraduate uh, level with a focus in physiology related subjects, uh, exercise physiology, ergogenics, exercise for health, and muscle physiology. And my thesis supervision runs along those lines. I direct the experimental physiology lab and my work focuses in muscle physiology, exercise trials, and myopathy models. I also, of course, do administration, but I'm not talking about that today. So this versus COVID-19, we experienced three lockdown periods between uh, March 2020 and September 2021. And initially, in all educational institutions, Physical presence was prohibited for a small period. So nobody was present anywhere. And then during that time, the government gave the opportunity to students to return home. Eventually, there were some exceptions for presence uh, in order to conduct research because many of us had commitments uh, and deadlines with funded research. And this included some postgraduate students. At the University of Thessaly, we were very fast to respond to the lockdowns. Within a week, um, we were operating online much faster than many other institutions. And this is because we had that prior experience of providing master programs, some of them international. So we had already good platforms for uh, e-learning. With the, within the first week of the lockdown, uh, we held um, faculty meetings and teaching staff meetings together to um, devise a plan, um, bring uh, to a level um, colleagues that may have been less uh, uh, experienced in uh, using digital platforms. And of course, the main um, challenge we all faced, and I think I share that with many of you, was actually adapting our delivery from the on-site physical direct contact to a distant uh, online delivery. But early from the start also, um, there were predictions about maybe problems with student engagement. And through the lockdowns, we tried to improve on this uh, issue and also the quality of evaluation including exams in a digital era and the impact this had on our university way of life and the quality of life of our students and us. So I will be 
giving an example on delivery and then uh, talking more about the feedback on the actual delivery experience from faculty and um, how students also felt about the situation and hopefully conclude with some takeaway messages for the post-COVID era. So the example I, I chose from is from an undergraduate module that I lead, um, which is Physiology of Exercise. It's considered for our students a heavy module because it carries six ECTS. So for those of you not familiar with the European credit transfer system, you can say that one ECTS corresponds to 25 hours of contact study assignments. So six ECTS is quite a lot of work. And I'm fortunate to have a teaching team, not a very large one, but a good teaching team. And Dr. Mitru uh, takes, uh, uh, took a lead with uh, helping me adapt uh, practicum from the on-site to the e-learning. So we too worked a lot on this area. Usually we have a two hour lecture exposure and a two hour practical exposure. So even with the e-learning platform, we kept the separation. So we had the e-learning lecture platform and then our approach based on the platform we had on the practicals. This uh, type of model takes place over 13 weeks of teaching. All modules take place over 13 weeks of teaching. The specific one, winter semester, with some final exam. So um, apologies for the busy slide, but just to put down some of the objectives that we have in the uh, template when we describe the module in a program of study. So it is a third year uh, module. So in-depth understanding of the physiological mechanism involved during the acute responses to exercise and chronic adaptations to training. Uh, students should be able to explain the impact of adaptation, should be able to monitor and explain modulation of selected physiological functions. Uh, to put it in a simple example, why the heart rate goes up and down more so with this type of exercise. They have learned in the previous year when they did human physiology and anatomy about uh, the variability of the heart rate rhythm. But when we go to this level, they need to use heart rate monitoring as a tool. Furthermore, uh, students will need to be demonstrating competencies that um, linked to the responsibility as tomorrow exercise trainer or specialist in a rehabilitation uh, program or a PE teacher in a special needs school. So they need to be able to show that they can safeguard the health of the exercise participant, that they can run basic testing protocols. So we can understand that from this type of objectives, there is a need to do practicals. So for every chapter, let's say, of the material, every lecture, uh, there are specific sub-objectives that need to be um, supported by practice-based learning. So in the chapter, in the thematic of skeletal muscle physiology, when uh, we have to cover uh, the area of high intensity exercise capacity. So the ability of a person to do really high intensity exercise, exercise such as sprinting, um, weightlifting, um, lifting heavy loads. Um, these are high intensity exercise capacity activities and they're linked with uh, a demonstration of quick decline of performance and fatigue. So to do or um, to link this to our ability to apply the practice-based learning, the student has to um, expose themselves, learn uh, testing procedures and applying those uh, 
during practical sessions. So in this thematic of um, skeletal muscle physiology, sub-thematic, uh, high-intensity exercise testing, a very uh, commonly used, worldwide used test uh, is the Wingate test, which is a test uh, based on a cycle ergometer, which is conducted over 30 seconds of voluntary intensity exercise. And many people call that supramaximal intensity. What they mean by that is that if we take the maximum oxygen uptake as a level of maximal, this is what most people use as maximal, the intensity of energy consumption uh, is much higher, is over that for much briefer period of time, of course. So there are some mathematical outcomes, numbers um, that describe the capacity of the subject. So a maximum power generated by the legs as the pedal, an average power and a fatigue index. So this kind of test is worldwide used for uh, assessment of athletes. And when repeated, it's not only good for sprinters per se, but it can provide additional information relevant to other types of sports, basketball, uh, for example, um, the, for some specific positions of players who play uh, soccer. So it is a very useful uh, learned a set of competencies uh, for our students. And we have a basic protocol, as with every exercise testing, we need to have uh, trained personnel present, and we need to have informed consent, health questionnaire, we need to do some baseline data collection, we need to do a warm up, and then there is a procedure of first sprint, a rest, second sprint, and the data that need to be collected uh, during the test. So we take this type of protocol in the uh, on-site situation, in the on-site delivery, we have copies of this protocol. And in small groups under supervision, the teacher explains the purpose of the process and the process and demonstrate the equipment and its use when it's on-site before COVID. And in that environment uh, of the laboratory, the students of the group self-assign the various roles. They make their own decision of who wants to do what. And uh, we prepare, they prepare the volunteer as students. Uh, if they need to have a health clearance and get the physical parameters, get familiarized to the test as a, as a group because they have to rehearse timekeeping, data collection, monitoring of vitals, taking uh, the score on the Borg scale and other things that may need to be done. And then at the end, collect all this data. As a team, they need to discuss the data, make copies among them of the notes they took. The team and each one fills exercise sheets with um, various tasks. And then as uh, a team, but individual as a a person, they need to be able to discuss the data in the subsequent contact time, which could be immediately after the lab or the next day. So this is just how it would look for them. They will have a, a form where they have to put all the data and they have to put the data they collect during the test. And then at some point, I'm not mentioning earlier, this will inform a big Excel file of the class. And they have to do this type of calculations um, and fill numbers and then start to comment if they saw differences between the two trials, if um, they have an opinion now on the abilities of the person with regards to exercise capacity notions we have covered in a previous lecture. So there are, of course, uh, big advantages of having a class 
together with our students. It has a high ecological value because when they go out to work, this is how it's done. You, you have a specialized lab, with specialized equipment, and you need to apply a protocol in a safe and hygiene uh, way. You need to be professional in how you conduct yourself and how you take care of your subject and how you collect the data. You will have a colleague probably, uh, together, so you need to work in pairs or in groups. And it is what we call an experiential learning um, experience. Of course, as you all know, with this type of practicals, uh, there is little time to actually focus on the meaning and we focus more on the process because as teachers, we have to take many small groups of uh, students through the lab and uh, there are health and safety concerns. We need to be careful that nobody gets injured. We need to be careful that uh, nothing goes wrong. So our focus is on making sure that the process moves. So if we have large groups to, of students to go through, it's, um, I, I, I can admit that sometimes it becomes a, process, a checklist, a tick list, did we do this, 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 and this? And then uh, questions may accumulate and the learning experience may not be balanced because we have slow learners, we have fast learners, and there's no much time during the practical to um, on the spot to sort out, to pose and ask, oh, I didn't understand that because the volunteer is there and things need to, pro to progress. And of course, there's the wear and tear of equipment. And depending on where people are based, some people have more money to support the equipment and some have smaller budgets. So that's another consideration. During the COVID pandemic, we uh, adapted this approach. We need this uh, test because it's one, of, as I said, one of the basic tests that uh, were needed for our uh, curriculum. Uh, so um, we had the online delivery. Our university used the Microsoft Teams and we had live contact time. We had the main, let's say, auditorium. And then we also had small breakout rooms. And we had some partial recording uh, due to the GDPR rules, we could record some aspects of work that only uh, if only us would be visible and not with students, of course, and not identifying student voices or faces. From the point of view of the teacher, again, the concepts were introduced, the equipment and use were demonstrated, but this was done on a video. In, a in the last um, a lockdown, we were able to have a camera and actually ourselves being the lab, so the equipment we have in the lab, but uh, we had a video that we could demonstrate. Then we provided sets of real data from past years and explain what we expect from them to do. The student had a choice to select uh, data sets because we could have a teenager, we can have a sprinter, we could have a basketball player, we can have a male or a female. And then similar calculations were performed and the students had to answer questions. And um, at the end uh, um, of this lockdown series, we reached the point where we used also Kahoot quizzes to motivate engagement because we noticed in the previous lockdowns that we were losing uh, engagement. The linked resources remain the same. So similar questions, but this time you see we gave the numbers, they didn't collect them. And then in the critical appraisal of the situation, the questions were similar like before. So you can imagine there's well, a lot of workload to do this thing for, for all the practical, but, uh, and there were, uh, I didn't put the extra workload in the cons, but uh, what is positive here is that of course, as we're talking now about online videos and um, ability to interact with individual students through the chat or openly through uh, tech, 
you know, taking the microphone to speak, we had time for reflection and the follow-up study time was better supported uh, by recordings and videos. We as teachers were not stressed about keeping the time or health and safety. Uh, and um, we, we offered a similar experience among students in the live um, on-site situation. Uh, there are some students who are so engrossed into the task that um, the learning experience is very different from the ones who observe, of course, and the ones who uh, actually take the lead in collecting data. We found that some hard skills uh, were not terribly affected, for example, calculations, and some soft skills were perhaps enhanced. But uh, this type of adaptation had low ecological value. And of course, the, all this depends, the level of skills and the ability to do teamwork depends on quality of the simulation. So uh, had we had an actual simulation software, I think we would be able to um, take out a lot of the weaknesses from our experience. So talking to faculty, we had many, many uh, faculty meetings during this uh, on, um, online, of course, during the lockdown period. Uh, we were catching up often. Uh, these faculty meetings were led by our head of department. Uh, where we discussed uh, feedback, but also within our small team of teaching the exercise physiology uh, mo uh, module or the preceding the human physiology and also some linked modules like biochemistry of exercise and elite uh, sports physiology. Um, I'm giving you a, a more uh, qualitative here uh, feedback of negatives and some positives in, in, in other slides. So we had, uh, of course, a big range of responses. Um, many colleagues were totally negative, but many more were so-and-so or even uh, positive. So in the negative sides, it was the faculty felt forced to adopt non-tested teaching methodologies. And what we mean by that uh, is that there is little research in our field about the efficacy of these uh, e-learning uh, exercises or even software in um, uh, the teaching of actual testing, actual sports application. Um, in other fields, there's more research, but in our field, there's little. And of course, their faculty themselves had variable levels of guidance depending on the prior, prior experience. Many colleagues uh, reported really extra workload, especially in the first lockdown, uh, problematic work hours because it was also early days and poor connections from home. It was a really strict lockdown. We couldn't go out of the houses. And after a couple of months of working like that from home with not appropriate uh, ergonomics, some problems, health problems of the faculty themselves. They also, some people had the sense that e-learning uh, gives no benefit uh, for the practical work applied skills they want our graduates to have and thinking that a generation of students have missed out on important skills. And also there was a strong sense of worry that we may have failed students from lower societal strata who some of them even only had a mobile phone to try to connect to a class. And also because this lockdown period essentially covered a year and a half, there are students that we never got to know. So we don't really, we feel we don't know them. Uh, as persons and for the needs. Uh, this uh, feedback from our department and colleagues agree to the general literature. For example, I'm citing here a study by Lefteri et al among Greek and Cypriot medical faculty where um, this uh, group reported 
that e-learning was considered a useful but not adequate tool for the type of skills they wanted to cultivate. And the teaching experience was not as enjoyable as before, and an increase in workload was quite heavy for the staff. And um, in a paper by D'Agostino, um, one can read about this issue about our field not having extensive research testing the efficacy of online and blended instruction to promote or inhibit this type of skill development. So there are some negatives that are not unexpected, but positives also, because a, nobody would like the universe to be totally closed. So it's the lesser evil, but this is the mid place, but we start to recognize benefits of technology. For example, many colleagues recognized that this was an opportunity to modernize their learning materials and to rethink the teaching tools they use. So they took teaching tools uh, that they've never used before, and now they have plans implementing them into on-site uh, scenarios. And the workload, the initial peak in workload is down to more normal levels, especially during the third lockdown, because everything had improved. Our own experience, our material, the way we interact, our comfort zone, the network was improved. And um, overall, that made for a better uh, teaching experience. Some um, thought went into what works. So for example, a fleet classroom where this type of exercises and videos are watched before the formal contact time. And then we spend more time discussing and problem solving and sorting out understanding issues worked for, mod for some uh, modules uh, like us, like ours, uh, for some specific thematics. And some colleagues even adopted the, uh, this type of approach for the whole module. But uh, they understood and we see that we need to give students clear guidelines and milestones because unfortunately, our university system doesn't uh, prepare students for self-paced study. And the realization, of course, that these students have a new uh, set of skills. And these, again, positives agree with the literature because others also noticed uh, some positive stance, especially among women towards distant learning. And, um, Another benefit is an increase in personal scientific and educational training opportunities because we didn't have to travel a lot because suddenly uh, our universe filled with online conferences and webinars, we found the time uh, to improve our own portfolio and our own knowledge. But there is a clear need for further research. Let's go to the students. Again, the student experience was variable depending on year of studies and family needs. The junior students hated the experience. The senior students also who lost projects, but people who worked, as we will see, were happier. And they were also afraid they may have missed important practical skills. And I have to say something here that it is one of the negatives, and I heard the discussion earlier about mental health. So through every, every year that we come across cohorts of students, uh, as part of various exercises, we um, engage students in small research they do within the class, and they learn how to conduct an interview and how to assess quality of life. So past years, we had scores of using uh, SF36 quality of life questionnaire for physical health, very high. I mean, after all the PE and sports science students and very high also for mental health. However, during the third lockdown, the first lockdown, we got especially, but that it improved slightly over towards the third lockdown, we got uh, scores that indicated a lower overall quality of student life and uh, lower um, mental health related quality of life. And this was um, 
reflected in the overall university. The university has a counseling service that saw a tremendous increase in requests for appointments, a student feeling uh, depressed, essentially, and needing counseling on how to handle the stress of the pandemic and the isolation. So our students, um, not all of them, but some seem not to be coping very well. The positives of this experience is that even for uh, very practical skills, like instructing somebody how to do an exercise, sewing uh, a, a skill, a practical skill, our uh, students uh, saw that they get digital era practical skills that can apply in professional life. Um, for example, now it's not uncommon to run an exercise class WebEx based. This was unheard of, at least in our country, before the pandemic. So the society has changed in a way that the students see that now skills and, and knowledge they, they had to forcibly you know, uh, engage with and acquire, now it's a useful tool for the modern era, for the new era. And of course, practical benefits for some students, flexibility for working students, cost savings when they didn't rent accommodation anymore, and self-pacing and learning. And this is reflected in some research in the, in the field of PE and sports science, where um, te teacher train trainers realize they can give more individualized attention through this. So I'm concluding in the next couple of slides. Lessons learned. First of all, we all uh, agree um, with the colleagues of the physiology teaching team, but also other colleagues. And based on the feedback we got through evaluation, module evaluations, that we need to safeguard and guide student time for reflection. That was something that, yes, we talk about it in, in our teaching workshops, uh, but we realized a gap in what we wished for and what we offered with the on-site modalities. And it was revealed when we were in the digital e-learning modality. Now returning back to on-site teaching from the 1st of October, that's a lesson we shouldn't forget. We should uh, make sure we have it implemented. And it appears also to many now feasible to adopt a hybrid approach, especially when we have constraints by time and resources, like a flip class also and student generated material. But we have many challenges and I want to, to consider these challenges for our, our community. Are we ready to capitalize on the efforts made to create effective e-learning or the moment we start live teaching, we just forget what we did and what we worked on. Because we need, we have a responsibility, we need to research more the efficacy of e-learning versus on-site learning. And we need to collect the experiences and share them in order to understand what worked best and um, go for a best practice. Are we prepared to support students and staff who may suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome because disorder? Because we see that there is a need. We realize during the uh, pandemic, uh, and it appears that maybe we need to train in counseling skills. That's something we didn't have to do. Some of us may have counseling skills because of a prior training, for example, medics, nurses, but other specialties of academics don't have counseling skills. So we need probably to get this. And should we rely on these platforms to diversify our student base? Could this prove dangerous for what we consider a typical university and a typical contract? Can we engage with students in co-developing this environment? These are things to be answered. I want to acknowledge the Physiology of Exercise teaching team, especially Dr. Mitru, with whom we extensively discussed, but also my colleagues, the head of department, 
uh, Dr. Sakas, who leads the clinical exercise physiology, Dr. Fluis, who leads the human physiology, and Professor Faturos, who leads the biochemistry of exercise for discussing problems and uh, trying to get our brains around sorting out these issues and collecting uh, feedback from other colleagues as well. Uh, I want to thank the teaching uh, workshop team, uh, which through the years uh, has supported me. I started as a bench scientist and I, I, I now get more interest and try to apply uh, pedagogy in my teaching and Dr. Infano Dean. And thank you all for your attention and your time. Okay, thank you very much, Christina, for the very valuable and insightful presentation. It is always nice to learn how others adapt and cope with things during this challenging time. Okay, let me kindly remind you, audience, that if you have questions for Christina, you might keep it for later because right now we are moving on to the fourth speaker first, and then after that, we will have a Q&A session for both speakers. Okay. We have come to the fourth session where we would have speaker from our very own institution, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Trigia. Dr. Dr. Irfanuddin, SPKUM Pekut, currently an Associate Professor of Physiology, Department of Physiology, and also the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs in the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Trigia, with educational background from the field of specialist of sports medicine, medical education, and physiology. He has been trained worldwide in various trainings, ranging from sports medicine training to medical education. I would proudly invite Dr. Ifanudin to present his presentation, sharing about learning situation in the Faculty of Medicine of the Prasasiriya during this pandemic. Dr. Ifan, the time is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Siska. Hello, Dr. Christina. And everyone, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see it, my screen? Yes, it is clear, bro. Okay. Okay. So everybody, good mornings and welcome to meet me. Uh, my name is Irfan Udin, but my colleagues always called me Irfan. And for this moment. Specifically, I would say this. I would like to say good evening to Professor Barbara Goodman in America, and good afternoon to Professor Michiko in Japan, and also, of course, good morning to Professor Christina in Greece. So, as you can see, that we had a speaker with different different times. So, and I would like to give appreciation for the committee to arrange the exact time so every speaker can present with their comfortable hours. And as the representative of the Faculty of Medicine that uh, I would like to thank to the speakers for your, your share of knowledge and experience in our seminar. So dear audience that I, this time I represent my friends from academic community in the Universitas Sriwijaya. I will share our experiences about how we have to adapt in the learning process during the pandemic. I will talk about the how to manage our faculty during the dis uh, disaster. And we start with the, our profile that we established since 1962 as the best health school in certain part of Sumatra. And also we are part of the cluster of the best health school in Indonesia. And we have uh, 21 study programs, uh, seven undergraduate programs uh, with health profession and 11 master degree or equal to specialist programs and two uh, PhD or internist consultants. And we have the 43 collaboration with uh, our faculty in Indonesia. And we have also eight university collaboration abroad, including two with Gunma University. And 
to carry the education, to, to carry the research and community service. And we collaborated to two main hospital, Muhammad Hussein Hospital and Siti Fatima Hospital, and together with a dozen of satellite hospital, health clinics, community health center, and other institutions in our educational network. And so we are very busy. Uh, but suddenly, however, our busy time, our busy lives were suddenly disrupted by the pandemic. And all wheels of life must be limited, including the educational programs. So due to the pandemic, we have had to limit 100% face-to-face meetings, especially for academic programs. Activity with strict protocol were only carried out for specialists, doctor profession in hospital. All students at the satellite hospital must be withdrawn. Student collective were learned from home and they only carry out in the main hospital with the proportion of uh, half of them half, half than usual. And they are not low to meet uh, directly with patient. All activities are carried out remotely. And what we have happened to us that in the early stage of the pandemics, we have to do the emergency efforts. When Zoom access is limited, we modified, for the example, like tutorial. We have no access of Zoom of that time. So we mod modified it with WhatsApp group. And uh, also line or Instagram. And of course, it has impact on the quality and academic atmosphere. The clinical skill of student will also decline and student, student must study with internet media, which has an impact of quota fee. And they use, you used to improvise at home or like you can see that in the picture, they have to use the dolls to substitute the mannequins and human participant. And problem also occur in students who are working in their final project due to the limited interaction with the subjects or research facility. And it has impact on their study time. And other issue is that the condition is also exacerbated by the confusion of standard protocol from government. We have to arrange and rearrange the protocol. This month, the minister give one protocol and other months the protocol is changed. So we have to always adopt it for that. And we have to face the limited personal protective equipment and as well as the worry of the, father, the parents that so they want to attract their children to return to home or hometown for the overseas student. But however, as a physiology that we believe that uh, human are destined to be able to adapt. So you can see that uh, in physiology, like uh, Professor B, our colleague said that there are three phases of the adaptation, the accommodation, the, acclimat the acclimatization and long-term adaptation. And so what, what we have done for early adaptation. So we have to make a guidebook, guidebook first with the reference from the public resource, like from WHO and the Ministry of Health, so that all the component can run according to the corridor and be accountable. And in the initial two months, uh, all activities except for the resident must study from home. Face-to-face uh, -face decision is depend on the status of the city at that time, for the example, when the Palembang is a red zone, so there is no face-to-face uh, -face meetings at all. But now we have uh, lower the zone, uh, the, the, the pandemic is uh, easier now. So we can adapt to combine with the face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, but 
it is very strict. The face-to-face -face meeting is only for absolute skill that we cannot uh, substitute it with the distant learnings. And even we have to do the face-to-face -face between the instructor and the participant cannot join in one room. They have to do in different rooms. And also we optimize the university of learning facility like uh, the e-learning here. And we have to modify the examination. For the example, you can see the picture. Uh, the student must use two camera when the assessment is uh, going on. And for the midterm uh, adaptation after several months, uh, we can, we're starting to organize the system based on the regulation of the authority, uh, such adjustment to competency goal that, uh, for the example, in dentists, they are, they, they publish the new standard for the competency. So we can change it based on this regulation. And we also set up the budget for online learning. And many lecturers are starting to be creative to making teaching materials uh, through multimedia and online. And we do, they do some innovation like flip classroom. And for the flagship, uh, we, begin, we begin to arrange space to space hours with quota of half the capacity and with limited our uh, working time and authority. And for the thesis that we make the guideline to change the research targets. For the example, they can use the secondary data or only article review. And that is some picture that uh, we have some example for dentists. They uh, change the patient to the phantom and all activities you can see that with a uh, highly adequate uh, personal protective equipment. And this is another example, the consultant, the vice dean, our vice dean for uh, cooperation, Dr. Hertenti. She did the bedside teaching here with the video. She saw the student from online, the condition of, of her patient. And everything must carry out uh, by maintaining protocol. They had to keep the distance between person. And we also uh, seek assistance from university and from various donors for helping the student with the personal protective equipment and free PCR tracking for, street, for uh, screening and free vaccination as well treatment and consumption assistance uh, with drugs or supplement uh, or food for those who are confirmed uh, positive. And then uh, for the next step, we started to structure a way to make a long-term adaptation. We began to make curriculums uh, changes that were oriented toward blended learnings and increase the role of formative assessment. And we also have uh, equipped several facilities to increase protection for the academic community and also complete supporting facilities such as uh, mannequin or HEPA filter here, as you can see from the picture. And for the assessment, we, we got the help from Professor Rob Carroll we compile the assessment guide for all the uh, study programs that uh, how to prioritize the formative assessment with Carrot Online. And of course, just like the other place, we still have a problem. The lockdown policy has prevented our students, especially from abroad, to come here. So we have several students from Malaysia that cannot return to Indonesia now, until now, up to uh, since one hour, one years ago, because the lockdown policy in, in uh, Malaysia. And 
Several times we had to stop the activities because there were positive cases in one cluster in collective. So if uh, there is a report, there was a report for the positive case. So the cluster of that place is, must be stopped and everyone on that place must be tracking with the PCR. And of course, there are doubts about the achievement of competencies and change of the attitude. They are complaining from our lecturer that this, the attitude of student already changed that they tend to be passive, passive and then indifference. And problems also occur in the lecturers, uh, boredom due to working time hours and with erratic working hours, and as well as the elderly that some uh, old lecturers complain the musculoskeletal disorder because they had to sit for a long time in front of the computer. And of course, they are also complain about the internet quota. But uh, the pandemic has a positive effect for us and I believe for other place. Everyone now adapted to a blended learnings. And I can see that now lecturers are more creative with information technology and multimedia, such as they, they try to learn to make the animation, video, and we see now that there are much of lecturers have their own YouTube uh, channel, and it is positive one. And this you can see that we can do some guest lecture with a world professor class with no cost because it is online. And we started to prioritizing the formative evaluation because they are uh, concerned about the low validity of summative examination. And other positive effect though due to pandemic is that uh, people or academics can easily adapt it to free campus programs. Yeah, because we have our minister have the obligation that every study program has to make has to change to uh, to intense the free campus. And because of the pandemic, we can arrange in that. And most of the lecturer and student now accustomed to independent learning with synchronous or asynchronous, of course. And I don't know if this is not still uh, no study of that, but several modification has been made in PBL or TBL programs. And there is a good report here from the clerkship especially in North that because they have to find their own participant in skill activity. So the student now is more taking care of their own family as a participant for their study. So I think that's all that I can give to you. And uh, this is Darwin's origin of spaces said that if, if we can adapt it, I believe that we can through this uh, pandemic and I hope this pandemic is going to end soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Siska. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Irfan, for the interesting presentation that really delivers a reflection of our current situation in our beloved institution, of which we hope others now we are moving on to the Q&A session for both speakers. We would like to invite Christina again, because we already have a few questions for you, Christina. I would help you read the questions first, and then probably the committee will help us share the slides so that you can read it too. Okay, first question uh, from Mr. Santosa. Relate to research and practical session, both for undergraduate and postgraduate students in COVID pandemic area, era, how is learning designed to set the lab in order to fulfill the COVID-19 protocols in on-site learning? 
What are the requirements for the students, the ratio of people and size of the rooms, how to manage the research subject or problems, how to set up time or the duration on the lab? I'll give it back to you then. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Great questions for the practical, the nitty gritty of it. So we get some instructions from the government about the maximum number of people at any uh, given space. So we have also the two, about two meter distance uh, or one and a half if the arrangement uh, uh, of the, the room allows. So what did we do in order to fulfill the protocols on the on-site learning? So, Truth is that between the some of the uh, lockdowns, especially the second and the third, there was a very brief period that we were allowed to do smaller group teaching. So um, the university provided extra cleaners, budget for cleaning. Uh, we had to rearrange the equipment. Uh, people, only the person who exercised didn't wear a mask, of course, the, the subject. Uh, everybody else had to wear the appropriate protective equipment. And um, from a room where we could usually have 10, 15 people, we could only have three to four people present. So... It wasn't very practical for the large number of students. So that was a, a, a big issue. It only lasted for two weeks though, then we were closed again. So what we did, we had some, as I said, the opportunity in the last lockdown to have a video camera to be the ones, the um, you know, vaccinated people and everything with the testing, COVID testing in the room and actually do the live demonstration. And then for small types of equipment that uh, students could get access to, um, we would hold sessions to actually demonstrate proper use one by one. Uh, for example, um, every pharmacist in, in, in Greece, every pharmacy store has a, a blood pressure monitor. So um, for not for these third year students, but for other type of uh, students, for example, we had, uh, had them into a kind of treasure uh, hunt to locate uh, those places that have the equipment, ask the owners if they wanted to support the actual student learning experience by allowing them to going to the pharmacy, take together a person from the family, their mother, the brother, uh, a relative, they're allowed to be together because, you know, the restrictions didn't allow in taxis or, or cars, non-relatives, and actually perform some assessment on the spot. Take a video of that, send it back to us. Take the interview at home using the questionnaire that we usually use with uh, probands and uh, send the video and the result. Um, go to the public open gym when it was allowed to use it and use the open uh, gym to perform a modified test uh, with uh, not the maximal, of course, it's a maximal modified test. So I didn't go through all this detail, but there were different places that we could draw from the resources or the open spaces, because we are very lucky we have good weather in, in, in Greece, you know. And in the past decade, there were many uh, open um, spaces created for exercise. Um, ideally, we would like to have a, a little suitcase with, with equipment that students could borrow, perform the test and return. We were able to try this idea with some students and we were able to try some ideas of using your own, uh, making your own equipment. For the lesson, the CPR lesson, we used pillows. We uh, had all students find the appropriate pillow or a doll. And after we taught on, online the technique, we had one by one 
a teacher student, the student demonstrating, pretending they have the, the patient and using um, a metronome on their um, mobile phone to, so they have a mobile phone uh, and they had the metronome and we set the pace and they had to keep the pace and the instructor was correcting the position of the arms. So for this type of things, we did distance solutions. And at the same time, I know I'm answering to a question that was on the chat. Um, the requirements, so for the students and the ratio of people in a room made it very difficult for some things to occur with students. The things we could do with students, we did only for that two week time. Now that we're coming back on on-site um, learning, we will try to use the hybrid. So for things that we definitely need students in, small groups, as I said, and for things that we can find resources outside, uh, find them outside. Okay. I think that answers the question. It really depends on the policy of the government in each country mm. on how to decide like how many people are in the room and how long can it be done in certain situation okay we're moving on to the next questions we've got a lot of questions for both of you so here's the second question i believe you have already answered it in the chat column but you might want to review it again so as i said it was the actual uh experience of using equipment, learning how to calibrate it, learn how to set uh, for the dimensions of the person, using the, you know, a, a measure tape and measuring distances and showing that the students can uh, do these things. And um, as, I, as, as I said earlier, we try to use different, either homemade or available uh, wider society equipment. Uh, to practice. Also, for some set of skills, uh, that's not for the final year people who finished last year, but for people who were third year and now they're fourth, we're going to be running remedial lab sessions. They have taken their exam, they have definitely taken their grade, but there are some skills that we feel responsible of teaching them. Uh, with on-site experience. So we're going to be offering these um, sessions once we, the, we have a lift of the, of the restrictions. So this is something our students have been informed. It's a voluntary action by uh, faculty to provide this. And um, we hope to be able to do that towards May. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. 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 Yes. okay. I think everybody here is believed that direct interaction with the participant of Asian with the com with the subjects in learning is the best one, I think. But the condition is cannot uh, uh, make us allow, uh, make offer make can cannot give us opportunity to do that. So in our experience that for, for this situation, we have to make a priority. So uh, we, we every, every day, the, the team of academics members uh, are make a meeting that what kind of the activity that cannot be done and we have the priority and we have to uh, for the some activity that cannot be changed by the distant learnings so we have to delay it until the end of the semester i think and how do we did do that so like the skill lab activity we open the skill labs is with a longer time and we make a schedule that if the for before the pandemic if a student can enter the the, the lab as 200 person or 200 student 
in one time. So we have to, be, to make a schedule only 20 or 30 uh, students. And yes, of course, it will make the time hours of the staffs will be longer. This is our, this is a consequence. And we had the experience in last two months when the uh, second wave, or I don't know, second wave or so many waves in Indonesia, I think. <laughs> in Greece, we have so many waves. <laughs> in last Augustus, that we have a big problem for community, for public health, that uh, the, the, the mayor cannot allow or the, 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 the health uh, official in Palembang city cannot allow our students to learn in their health community service units for one month. So, uh, so what, we, what we have done that, uh, like that, that we have to delay and we have to reschedule it. We have to find a good time, but uh, we have some change the activity like cases. Uh, we give them uh, like a public health case uh, from distance. But I believe it is not optimum uh, compared to direct observation, but I think it's the best we can do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the additional explanation, Dr. Irfan, reflecting from our own faculty. Saya rasa ini juga menjawab pertanyaan untuk pertanyaan berikutnya, Dr. Irfan, dari Bapak Santos. Oh, yes. There is, there is one, one, one issue that uh, the question from Dr. Santos is that how about the budgets? <laughs> they ask the budget. So of course they, they were they they are increase in budgeting because uh, we have to prepare the uh, protective equipment for the student, and then we have to prepare the PCR tracking, and but we can do the some substitute budgets that, for example, that there is no traveling cost now. Or everything is cut down for traveling costs and then meeting costs. So we cannot give the staff uh, for lunch for the meetings for now on. So, so everyone has to bring their own lunch because there is no budget for that. And, and there is one, one, one question that we plan to, because uh, the pandemic is going to calm, and we plan to make the face-to-face -face again. So what, what, what we will do. So uh, now we are tracking for this, all of the students to be vaccinated. This is our priority. Our target is for uh, this month is that 100% of, especially for uh, our faculty has to be vaccinated. So they cannot enter the faculty before uh, they were vaccinated. This is our first priority. And then, of course, we have to prepare, uh, we have to, the screening, a good screening for that. Actually, uh, one we have done that I forgot to present that we have online, uh, what we call Dr. Siska, said doctor online. So, which means that we have online, uh, program that can be downloaded, uh, especially for our students. So if they got something wrong, they got fever or something wrong there in their condition, so they can report it like directly to the chat doctor online. I think uh, this is what we have done. Thank you. Okay. Like Dr. Irfan said, we have already do some measurements to prepare the new hybrid method of learning when the pandemic has already come down and the storm has already passed. And the next question is, I believe this is from probably the students because she asked about how can we manipulate our virtual learning to feel like we're really dealing with real <laughs> patients. Because sometimes as you can see on your slide before, yeah. Yeah. students use dolls or yeah. plushies. <laughs> So, uh, do you have any opinion on that? I believe that all, I, I believe it's naturally that everyone has to make their own creativity. Uh, 
for this uh, the second question that uh, i believe that uh, they can use their own family i have my own daughter is now is a medical uh, student so they asked me to be her participant so how come that i i'm i'm your teacher uh, it's okay that i cannot I, i will not show your face so my friend cannot they're not afraid of you <laughs> something like that so we can i think uh, everyone can create it for that we can change it with the participant but their own family for a blood pressure and for the future medical graduates competency so uh, we have a meeting or some some several talks with all of dean in indonesia that how about the achievement of competencies for nurses for dentists and for medical students in indonesia due to pandemic and uh, i don't know the results yet but i believe they will be change the obligation of the competencies uh, obligation for the for the reason i think so like that thank you okay thank you Dr. probably christina would like to add some based on your experience how to in boost the experience for the students so especially um, like the blood pressure thing yes so um, we have a, a, a specialty of students who take the exercise for health direction and of course you need to be able to to measure these vitals not because you're taking the place of a nurse but because you're next to a person who may have some problem some health problem and they need it so um, we after assigning this task i have to say that we found that it helps students create a professional network what i mean usually we train students in some skills then they leave the university and then they start to try to make their connections with physicians and with rehab centers where they may find a, a, a job now because they were in their hometowns and we asked them to find a relative uh, uh, who has health clearance for exercise so they can use this person as their own uh, subject for light testing but the first thing was to evaluate the vitals so that forced our students to immediately look around who's the family doctor who's the physician who treats their aunt who has diabetes who's the cardiologist who treats their father and they came um, we collected this type of contacts then these uh, medics actually uh, gave the clearance to some selected people of their environment and they used their own um, family members to actually measure Uh, with the equipment, as I said earlier, they could gather from uh, professionals, health professionals in the area. So uh, we didn't expect it to be so successful, but because uh, the society felt we are all in this together and the uh, health professionals really wanted to help the students. So we saw a good response and only uh, in one case uh, we had a student who couldn't uh, do this type of exercises. But we had to be more time, as uh, Dr. Infano did said, we had to be more on the screen ourselves to observe or uh, on another time to see the videos. And yes, I would have prepared to have the, the student and the proband and actually correct some things with my own hands, but the collective wisdom of, uh, helped. So I don't know how practical it is with really large number that was practical with a small number of students, uh, no more than 25 that were taking this direction and they needed this type of guidance. Okay, thank you for the insight. And then we have another question also for Christina. Okay, probably the committee will help us share the slide again. From Dr. Ayesha, she is asking about considering incorporating peer teaching for your hybrid approach. Have you ever thought about doing so? 
Thank you. I was okay. just trying to type my answer. So good that you brought it back. Uh, in a way, uh, informally, I have to say that it happens because um, the way that uh, our uh, university operates, we have final year students that there are some occasions that they come into contact with the younger students and they get a task of showing them how to operate within a specific exercise. But I have to say that I didn't consider it uh, in a formal framework before. So thank you for the suggestion because that could, especially now that we're turning on on site, and as you uh, imply, we're going to be having large numbers that of the this year students, but also year, students who need to catch up with some skills. Uh, maybe that's something that we need to put into our framework. So this is an excellent suggestion for me. Thank you. We always learn from something new for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the question. She also has a question for Dr. Irfan. Okay. Uh, she's appreciating the great work of the whole faculty members. But she's asking also the same thing about hybrid learning design. Yes, I think if the pandemic has subsided, I think that we, uh, we still have plan to optimize the hybrid learnings. Uh, we plan that uh, hybrid learning can be done for adding for the additional activity uh, beside the direct face-to-face -face learning. Uh, we plan that a hybrid can, uh, will be used for the formative assessment activity and uh, additional uh, activity like a pit classroom that we want to every hour of our lecture to do the flip classroom. And of course, for the clock seat that we have to use the blended learnings to optimize the uh, communication between the satellite hospital and main hospital with uh, teleconference and telemedicine, something like that. So I think uh, this three part of the activist, uh, activity can be done after the pandemic with blended learning. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I truly hope that we all believe that we will pass this form and then we will have to prepare for things to come in the future. I believe that that's all for the question session. Thank you very much for both speakers. It is so much fun to learn from both of you. As we all heard from both speakers, we are all in the same storm. It hits us significantly in every part of the world. It is up to us to rise up to the occasion and strive for the future. Thank you once again, it is such an honor. But before we come to an end for this session, we would like to virtually invite you all to give an air certificate. First of all, we would like to ask the committee to spotlight Christina and the e-certificate. Oh. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Christina wanted to share some of your pictures from her hometown. Oh, yeah. Right? She already prepared for us. You, you must show it. She yeah. must show it. Okay. After this for the session, I would like to invite you to share some. Okay, you share it right now. Okay, you sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thessaly, Mount of St. Horace. It's really cool. Been wanting to visit Greece because I am a, quite a big fan of mythology. But you said you live in Trakala, right? Oh, very nice park. Okay. Hopefully, we can visit your place. Oh, you're still on mute. Sorry, you're still on mute. It's, okay, it's okay. Okay. So, uh, the monastery city near Trikala. So before it was the, that's the center, there's a river going through the city of Trikala. It's a small, it's a small city and there's a river going through and it's considered the birthplace of Asclepius. Uh, and um, we have the Metera monasteries near Trikala. It's really uh, amazing site with monasteries perched on top of the uh, rocks. 
we get snow in the area. Oh, yeah. Lots of snow sometimes. And that's why uh, it's very beautiful for hiking and sports. There is a lake, uh, Plastira, uh, in close proximity, about 30 minutes. And it's a place for lots of sport, outdoor sports, rafting, uh, skiing, or, you know, um, using uh, bicycles and, and jeeps to go around. It's, it's beautiful to not only the sea, as I saw, but also the mountain. Really nice. Very that, nice. Yeah, so, that makes us want to visit it. Next, next Dr. Sisko, we, we must bring our student to Greece, okay? <laughs> we should do a, an exchange program. We should yes, find exchange uh, an exchange we program. We can do that, Krishna. I, I, I will can come to your country. That. I haven't come. Yeah, sure, yes. sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to say uh, hello. That I I I see that our senior from Physiology Society, the the president of Indonesian Physiology Society. I I see this. Uh, also become the audience for this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Ermita. And then our senior, Dr. Adrianta, of the Indonesian Physiology Society, also the, the member of International Union Physiology Society. Thank you. Yeah, and Dr. Adrianta. College. Yes, <laughs> I, I can. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you once again, Christina, or you might say in Greece, Sef Haristo. Sef Haristo, parakalo. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we will now invite Dr. Irfanuddin to hand out the e-certificate. The committee, would you please to spotlight Dr. Irfanuddin and the e-certificate? You can bring it directly to me. Oh uh, yeah, sure, because yeah, we'll be so. <laughs> In front for the interesting presentation as the representative of our own beloved faculty. Okay, here's the e-certificate. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, we have finally come to the end of our webinar. Thank you all for staying with us. The COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly disrupted the well-established traditional structure of medical education all over the globe. The new limitations of physical presence have accelerated the rapid transition in medical education platform to online learning environment. The urgency of this pandemic has rapidly brought on the development of many innovative educational strategies across the world, as we learned from the three speakers today. More sharings and brainstorming from all over the globe are required to accurately depict how this unparalleled period has affected all aspects, including medical education. But along with all the difficulties the pandemic has brought to us, this pandemic reminded us that human collaboration through science is one of the greatest tools in dealing with threats. Applying the same collaborative science in education and specifically in medical education, we could raise our optimism for the future of medicine. Like Christina once said before, we're all in this together and education is the foundation upon which we build our future. So on behalf of the committee, I would like to say thank you for all the speakers for their interesting and insightful talk, and also to the audience for your active participation. We hope to see you again in the future of Dias Natalis of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sriwijaya. Jaya selalu Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya. I am Ziska Mariska, signing out as the moderator for today's webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I will now hand over the show to our Master of Ceremony, Nuzla. Web moderator Dr. Zisko Maritska, who has led the discussions to be to become a fruitful and engaging discussion. Move on to the next agenda. I would now like to invite Dr. Zisko to come forward to uh, to receive the certificate of appreciation. So, Dr. Zisko Maritska, please. Okay, I believe that it's now my turn to receive the e-certificate that I've been virtually hand out to all the speakers before.
Okay, once again, we thank all our panelists for sharing their valuable insight on the matters and also to our moderator. Now I'd like to invite everyone to turn on their camera for a group photo. So all ladies and gentlemen, please turn on your camera. Come, come. Okay, one and two, three. Okay, for the second slide. Okay, the third slide. Oh, the seventh slide. And eighth slide. The photo sessions thus end our event for today. Hence, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the ladies and gentlemen for being here today with us. I am Nuzla Emira, signing off as the master of ceremony for today's webinar. I apologize if there are mistakes in presenting the event and to God I seek for forgiveness. Wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christina. See you again. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Thank you. Music, music, music. Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya Untuk mencapai visi menjadi Fakultas Kedokteran terkemuka di Asia Tenggara Yang berbasis pendidikan, penelitian, dan pelayanan di bidang ilmu kedokteran dan kesehatan pada tahun 2025 Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya Terus berupaya mengembangkan serta melengkapi diri dan fasilitasnya agar dapat menghasilkan lulusan yang berkualitas guna memenuhi kebutuhan dokter, dokter spesialis, dan subspesialis, magister kesehatan, dan tenaga kesehatan yang profesional, baik lokal, nasional, hingga internasional. Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya merupakan fakultas yang keempat yang didirikan di Universitas Sriwijaya berdasarkan keputusan Menteri Perguruan Tinggi dan Ilmu Pengetahuan SK nomor 668 garis miring A garis miring 3 Romawi garis miring 1962 tanggal 4 September 1962 dengan demikian pada tahun 2021 ini Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya akan memasuki disnatalis ke-59 tahun. Saat ini, Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya memiliki 21 program studi, yaitu 1. Program Studi Pendidikan Dokter S1 2. Program Studi Ilmu Keperawatan S1 3. Program Studi Kedokteran Gigi S1 4. Program Studi Fisikologi S1 5. Program Studi Biomedik S2 6. Program Studi Biomedik S3 7. Program Studi Profesi Dokter 
Profesi 8. Program Studi Profesi Dokter Gigi Profesi 9. Program Studi Profesi Nurse Profesi 10. Program Studi Ilmu Kesehatan Anak Spesialis 11. Program Studi Ilmu Bedah Spesialis 12. Program Studi Ilmu Penyakit Mata Spesialis 13. Program Studi Ilmu Penyakit Kulit dan Kelamin Spesialis 14. Program Studi Ilmu Penyakit Dalam Spesialis 15. Program Studi Ilmu Penyakit Dalam Subspesialis 16. Program Studi Ilmu Kebudanan dan Penyakit Kandungan Spesialis 17. Program Studi Ilmu Patologi Anatomi Spesialis 18. Program Studi Ilmu Penyakit Syarat Spesialis 19. Program Studi Ilmu Kesehatan THT KL Spesialis 20. Program Studi Ilmu Anestesiologi dan Reanimasi Spesialis 21. Program Studi Ortopedi Spesialis Sejak awal berdirinya FK Unsri memiliki kampus pertama yang terletak di Jalan Dr. Muhammad Ali, Kompleks Rumah Sakit Muhammad Husin Palembang, yang juga merupakan rumah sakit pendidikan utama FK Unsri. Saat ini, FK Unsri telah memiliki tiga kampus yang digunakan, yaitu Kampus Madang, Kampus Bukit Besar, dan Kampus Indralaya, dengan luas kampus 51.253,65 meter persegi. Pengembangan dan pembinaan pendidikan dokter di FK Unsri berorientasi kepada ilmu pengetahuan dan teknologi kedokteran dan kesehatan, serta pengabdian kepada masyarakat. Selain memiliki tiga gedung perkuliahan, FK Unsri juga memiliki fasilitas pendidikan yang sangat memadai dan berstandar antara lain ruang belajar terdiri dari ruang kuliah, ruang tutorial, ruang konferensi, ruang perpustakaan, ruang laboratorium terdiri dari lab kimia dasar kedokteran, lab bio optik, lab anatomi, Lab Bioteknologi Lab Keterampilan Teknik atau Skill Lab Lab Komputer atau CBV Lab Kedokteran Gigi Lab Hewan atau Animal House Lab Psikologi Wahana Pendidikan RSUP Dr. Muhammad Husin Palembang RSUD Siti Fatima Provinsi Sumatera Selatan RSJ Dr. Ernaldi Bahar RS Khusus Gigi dan Mulut RS Mata Masyarakat RS Bayangkara RS Akagami RSUD Rabai Muarainim RSUD Prabu Muli RSUD Skayu Puskesmas Kota Palembang Dengan terus membuka diri serta menjalin hubungan kerjasama yang baik antar lembaga di dalam maupun luar negeri Meningkatkan mutu pendidikan, penelitian, jurnal nasional dan internasional serta mengoptimalkan kegiatan kemahasiswaan, serta memanfaatkan teknologi dengan kemudahannya. Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas Sriwijaya meyakini dapat menjadi salah satu fakultas terkemuka yang ada di Asia Tenggara dan diakui dunia.